pretty trying. Yeah, it's been pretty rough and it's been pretty cold. I mean, I brought a woolly hat to uh, to get from London Airport to, to come out to Miami. I didn't expect to be wearing it here, but the first two days were really cold, very rough on the water. The breeze wasn't super strong, but the defining feature here is the shallow waters on this um, on this side of Florida. We're on the west coast of Florida facing into the Gulf of Mexico and the water's only about 16 foot, foot deep which kicks up some really nasty short sharp waves and the added problem for the 49ers is if they capsize they're in big danger of bouncing the, their mast on the bottom of the ocean and breaking their mast and we've had a lot of breakage this week already. Which is a bit of a pity um, that uh, it, it's, uh, the stakes are so high, gear breakage, breaking masts, that um, it can really compromise someone's performance. This is the world championship, this is the most important world championship in the four year cycle leading up to the Olympic Games which are six months from now, Rio 2016 so not only the honour of being world champion, this is a selection event for many of the sailors here and it's how they perform this week that could determine whether they go to Rio six months from now to represent their nation at the Olympic Games so there's a lot riding on this week. So we are behind in the schedule um, day one day two as we talked about the conditions were really the wind was the uh, the the waves were the issue with the shallow water the, the breeze was around 20 knots but the wave conditions were uh, meant that very little racing was had so we are behind but uh, we'll endeavor to catch up today I'll bring in now Marcus Bauer Marcus is driving sail tracks here for us and uh, he uh, does such a fab fabulous job, double Olympian, European, three-time wo European world champion. Do you sit here with itchy feet and think, oh, I'd like to be out there rather than, uh, you know, driving the bus here? Well, I had, I had no time to think about it, really. We've been, uh, we've been here since three days setting up everything, equipping all the boats with the trackers, uh, getting the onboard cameras onto the boats that we see right now, and we're really looking forward to uh, three beautiful days of sailing, getting really close to the action here. We've got three minutes to go uh, for the start. We're going to have live leaderboards all throughout, knowing what's going on with the score, and to Today we are also on board uh, with the top three teams currently in the ranking. So we'll, we will look at the leaderboard quite soon, I believe, before the start goes off. Well, we'll just go through. Uh, so we're looking at three races today. First up for the 49er FX for women. And uh, we've got 2.45 to go to the start. We'll just have a quick look at the leaderboard after five races. Andy, you can talk us through the leaderboard quickly. Now, there are some surprises up here. This is not necessarily some of the sailors we expect to see, but leading at the moment are the Germans, Victoria Yurtzok and Annika Lorenz sailing out of their skins. That We expect to see Danes doing well, but not necessarily the Schutz sisters, but they're the ones that are performing this week. We'll come back to where the other Danes are that should be on this top ten. Charlotte Dobson, Sophie Ainsworth from GBR also sailing very, very well in third place. Alex Maloney and Molly Meach, they've struggled the last couple of years. They won the first world championship in the 49er FX in 2013 but they're coming back strong having won the build-up regatta in Miami just a week or so ago. Form sailor in this fleet in fifth place Martino Grail and Kaina Kunz from Brazil they've come second first second in the previous three world championships never out of the top two in this world championship so I would say that they're the favorites and then Beckering and Dutz they struggled to uh, qualify for the Netherlands, but they might well be doing it. We must be running out of time fairly soon here, so let's get back to the uh, the, the start. The action. We've got a, a minute, uh, minute and a half to go. I can tell you the weather conditions are beautiful out of the south, uh, not like earlier in the week, around 10 to 12 knots, uh, quite close to the shore, great for the television to cover and, and to monitor on board as we now go to the German crew. Victoria Yurtzok, they're standing up, holding the main sheet. Annika Lawrence just out of picture. These girls are somewhere up towards the committee boat end of the start line, the right-hand end of the start line, so that's what they believe to be the favoured side that they want to get off on. It's just under a minute to go. We get the wind readings of the starting of the committee boat. And there is a slight bias. We're getting the wind readings off the committee boat, and there's a slight bias to the left-hand side. I think that's where the majority... Um, of the fleet will be dashing down. We see quite a lot of boats on the on the right hand side though. Uh, let's see if our wind readings are accurate. Well it looks good. So we're now coming up into the last 30 seconds 
and uh, the boat control, Andy, for uh, with these 49er FXs, boat control in this, uh, you know, the time on distance and start so important. It's very critical because the rudders are small, and, and if you haven't got forward movement on these boats, you can't steer the boat, so they're really difficult to control. But here you can see just how tight it is at the start line. One of the boats closest to our picture just tacked onto port tack, looking like they're going to start underneath the fleet, which sometimes is a strong move. Three seconds to go. The finish are just about to accelerate. They are the closest to this left-hand end of the line, and off they go. And the Finns are away. They've got to get past that anchor chain, which they've managed to do. Finland, Canada, and Germany, and then Brazil. That's the Martin Grail, the world champion from two years ago, choosing to start out the left-hand end of the line. So if we look, at, we'll go over to Marcus. Marcus, you brought up the animation. A bit of line bias there. Yeah, um, looks like the right-hand side of the line uh, was a little bit favoured. The boats coming off the uh, starboard end are looking a little bit better. Argentinian team in the lead right now. Looks like uh, there's a, a couple of OCSs, boats going back behind the line. Maybe, Marcus, you can bring up who, who was over early. Yeah, I see... Uh, uh, USA 224, that's Stellan Berry going back, Hank and Scott, and it looks like everybody's Ge going general back. Recall. That was a general So recall. the first race for the 49er FX here on day four of the World Championships in Clearwater. And uh, as often happens, Andy, false start, <laughs> first race of the day, perfect conditions. Yeah. Commentator's um, nightmare. It is, <laughs> yeah. Here we are. We, we, we get at least... I would say seven minutes before another possible start. But you see the, the sailors handling the boats perfectly in these lighter conditions. This has not been the story of previous days. We've really seen very strong winds. In fact, I would say not that strong winds, but very, very harsh conditions. Moderate winds, but with the short waves here that you get from the shallow waters, even when you're getting up to just 12 or 13 knots of wind speed, which normally is a walk in the park for these boats, it's been really, really challenging. And um, people pitch polling, that means the boat falling head over heels, um, sailors in the surf. Um, I mean, in fact, we've even had uh, people thrown out of ribs. Some of the coaches have, uh, have been thrown out of their uh, power boats here as well. And boats have been turned upside down. So quite severe conditions. Um, but here, perfect conditions today. Uh, but when you have easier conditions, it means that the sailors push the line a little bit more. They push the start line. And that's what we saw just then, which is why we've got this uh, returning to the start and we've got to go through the starting procedure all over again. So just recap, we've, uh, there's been one start, it, it was a general recall, so the fleet now go back behind the line, and the race management team will regroup, they might change the bias in the line, Marcus talked about there was a bit of line bias there, do you think that caused the issue, people pushing early? Uh, it, didn't, it looked like a really good start to me, I didn't look uh, exactly at the flag going down when it went down, but it looked clean to me, um, I it, was surprised for the general recall. Maybe there was a shift we didn't even record. Um, no one was particularly poking out there, were they? So no. it, it, if it was a, a general recall because boats were over, I would say a lot of the fleet must have been over. It's interesting, isn't it? We talk about general recalls and race management. And, of course, the, race, the, the role of race management in these in all regattas, but especially at a world championship later in the year, it will be the, the Olympic Games. It's absolutely crucial, isn't it, that the race management team, they're on the water. It's, it's a bit of a thankless task, but it's so vital for, for fair and even racing, Andy. Uh, yeah, it is, and, and it's one of the reasons why the 49er class chooses to take around its permanent race officer with it. That's David Campbell James from Great Britain, represented uh, Great Britain in the Olympics about uh, getting on for 40 years ago in the Tornado Catamaran. Uh, but he's got that sailor's understanding of what they're looking for, and it means there's a level of consistency when you're flying your own race officer around the world with you. Yes, he certainly uh, like like the very good race officers in the world of yachting, and there's a number of them. It's it's so important that they have the trust of the sailors, and they understand the needs and and the dynamics of the boat. And David, he, he's been around this class ever since I've known him, and uh, he does. He's got res they the sailors respect him, and he respects the sailors for fair and even racing, and and. Uh, was illustrated just there. And it's been a particularly trying first half of the week for uh, any race officer, and uh, it's been pretty stressful um, because they are behind schedule, so they're trying to get as many races in as they can. 
Uh, originally, this was meant to be the first day of Gold Fleet finals, where we we split the the top and the bottom half of the fleet out. Um, but we're still doing one final day of qualifying today before the final two days are used for Gold Fleet racing. I well, let's, while we've got this little break, let's just try and have a look at the course. Um, the we can see the race management team. There's a black flag up there now, which means if you break the line early and uh, we don't, I'm just being told now, we don't have a course animation. Uh, no, change of plan, we do. So I'm just asking the boys here to bring up the course animation. And uh, maybe, Marcus, you can um, run us around the 49er FX course here today. Yep, so we see the start and we're... Here we go. So up to, up to the windward mark, down. It's basically just a simple up and down wind course, uh, down to the gate. Um, that is three laps uh, scheduled at the moment and down to the finish line, which is the same as the starting line. So it's essentially a, a windward lured or, or a sausage, a sausage uh, type of course, upwind, downwind. And, and the, really the pinch points, Marcus, of, of, in terms of top well, marks starting? Well, what's going to be interesting today is that uh, we, we have the shoreline on the left-hand side of the course, and that's going to influence uh, how the breeze is going to bend um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see whether uh, the majority of the fleet is going to head out to the left-hand side, um, and and or if if it's better to go on the far side out onto the clearer clearer water. One minute to go, and the big difference this time, if you look on the committee boat, that black flag just comes down, and what that tells us is that this is going to be a black flag start now. If anyone crosses the line this time, there's no second go at it. They will be disqualified, and um, so this is why you're seeing the fleet hang back from the start line a little bit more. You really don't want to risk that start um, being over on early on the start, so a cautious approach by the whole fleet this time. Look at Brazil too. They're choosing to go for the pin end of the line. They want to win the pin, which is one of the strongest starts that you can pull off in the 49er because it gives you a level of freedom about how you start. So to pick up the sale numbers, it's Germany 55 that we should be looking for, Denmark 49 and GBR 22. They're the top three as we look across the... We can see the Italians who are current, the current world champions up towards the Wimbledon end. So five seconds to go as we come up to the start of the first race on day four. Talk us into it, Andy. What do you will think? it be a clean start this time? It looks like it will be. We're on board with Victoria Yurtzok and Annika Lawrence, the current series leaders, but they haven't got the best start. They're going for an early tack, and they want to get out to the right-hand side and try and get some clear air. Now, was that a tactic? It looks like it might have been a tactic because they started quite close to that end. So it looks like the Germans want to go out to sea. The Brazilians, they're just behind the Americans front of our shot. They're sailing now very close to shore, right in front of our commentary position. And the water must be extremely shallow. And I wonder how close the Americans will dare go because they could actually run aground if they go too close into the sandy beach here at Clearwater. And uh, sandy beach, you can see the discoloration of the water. Marcus, what have you seen out off the line? Well, uh, I saw the same. You saw that uh, just a few boats break away. It looked like a planned tack that we saw on Jutzok and Lawrence going out to the right-hand side. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a right-hand shift going up the course because on the left-hand side, the wind might just bend a little ac uh, across the coastline coming in like that. So up the coast, maybe a right-hand shift that the boats can take advantage out uh, of that are uh, heading out to the right-hand side of the the course. And we're looking at Paris Henken and Helena Scott from the USA and they are vying for selection here um, for the America at Rio 2016 and they are currently the leaders out towards the left hand side so very good start by them because they're not typically in the top 10 of these races. So it looks like the uh, the Kiwis uh, might be having a little piece so as we go back now though there, it is Henken and Schutt that look good the american team martina grail who won the worlds in 2015 is right in the money but it's early days as we head up the first beat for the first time it looks to me like the brazilians are struggling to hang on to the americans the brazilians really don't want to attack but they might be forced to attack away because the americans are sailing extremely fast on this left hand side. 
Just seen the Americans tack there, just got across the Brazilians. Now, they managed to get away with it, which is great sailing by America, but they do have to duck the next boat, which is the reigning world champions, Giulia Conti and Francesca Klapsic, with that number one on their sail and the Italian flag just tacking there. So it's number one and number two from the world championships from Argentina at the end of last year are now on this left-hand side of the track. So the boats that came across on starboard, they're on port. And we also saw uh, Alex Maloney, Molly Meach, the Kiwis, they tacked in a lane down there, just in a lane on, and on port. So they're in clear area as now they head upwind as we just got a bit of a, a frame freeze there as we go on board. Great on boards, Marcus. Well done, I must that's, say. That's the on board of Grail and Kunze. So looking down... From that angle, it doesn't look like they're, they're in the lead currently. They're lagging behind a little bit. Not doing too badly out on the left-hand side. It's still early days, and you can just see the number one occasionally on the left of our picture pop into focus there. That's uh, Julia Conti, Francesca Klapsic. So two really world-class teams here side by side. The difference is the Italians are a little bit heavier. The Brazilians are quite light, and they, uh, they sail extremely well, but they use, need to use all their technique to stay up with the, uh, the heavier teams. In terms of uh, crew weight, what, what are your thoughts? What's the ideal crew weight a total crew weight for a, a 49er fx what, what what's the what's the ballpark figure? it's around 130 kilograms and i know that victoria yurtsok and annika lawrence have really been uh, trying to pile on the weight both with food and with work in the gym which the girls aren't always happy with because they don't they don't necessarily want to uh, fill out for uh, when they're on the shore and uh, going out in the evening but uh, when they're on the water they they want to be heavy for these conditions and so we've seen the germans try to put on the weight from about 120 kilos getting up towards that ideal 130 kilo mark marcus this group on the the left hand side looking up the track they look quite quite strong as we look at the three boats yeah and... but it, i wouldn't be surprised if uh, grail manages to squeeze in up there at the windward mark it's surely going to be an interesting first mark rounding who can make it in and who can uh, cross over from the other side the the mark should come into the picture quite soon on the left hand side so, Marcus, when, when you're going on these long boards, yeah, they're, they're not, uh, looks like they're close to ley line coming into the, into the first mark. When you're helming, as you have done and, at two Olympics, what are you actually trying to achieve? Are you looking for height? Are you looking for pace? Are you looking position relative to the pack? What, what would be your mindset if you were out there at the moment? Well, I mean, closing in, you're trying to go optimum VMG. Uh, at some point, you're just uh, starting to pray to find the right gap to make it in with the right of way. And that's the big question now. Are they going to make it in? Can they squeeze in? Looking good now. Re really good sailing by the Americans here. And there's a huge gap. They, they, they'll make it in easy. So that tells us that the left-hand side, those who started at the left-hand end of the line, sailed closest towards the shore. They chose the paying side of that first beat. So at the first mark, it's USA 92 in the lead as they come round. And We're watching Kayena Kunz hoist the spinnaker there on the Brazilian boat, going round just in second place, being chased hard by... Julia Conti and Francesca Klapsic really trying to push over the top of the Brazilians. Big race on between the world number one and number two here with the Americans out of shot leading both of those teams. And it looks like oh something not quite right there on the Italian boat, but they've got settled and up and running again. But it's just given a bit of breathing space there to Brazil, who for a while looked like they might have been rolled by the Italians. But the Brazilians now safely in second place in this race. Uh, but with quite a big gap to the leader, uh, really, really good sailing by the Americans, Paris Henkin and Helena Scott. So we're on leg two, heading downwind now, down to the, back to the, the bottom of the course as we uh, look at one and two in the, in the world as they head downwind. Marcus, in, in terms of uh, the, what we're looking at now, they, they've come around the mark, bear away set, they set up for that bottom mark gate. 
Yep, they, they've got a choice of marks just on the right-hand side of the uh, screen just then. So when they get to the bottom, Henkin and Scott have to decide which side they want to go. Now, based on how well the left-hand side of the course worked for them previous time, my strong bet would be that they are going to choose the left hand of those marks as we see in the animation there because it was the sure side of this course that was paying first time round. And I'm sure that's, that's a fact not lost on any of these three teams at the front at the moment. So leading the pack, we got, we've got uh, the USA pairing of Hankin and Scott, and uh, they this is their best race. They've certainly got a nice little gap between themselves and the, the following pack. Put that down to a good start and uh, a, a good first tack, lay line to the top. They mark. won the pin. with The sailors talk about winning the pin, and that means uh, getting uh, starting at the very left-hand end of the line. It gives you a lot of freedom about how to sail the boat, and they had the legs on the Brazilians up that first leg. They, the Brazilians had to tack earlier than... Well, no, no sorry, the, the Americans managed to cross in front of the Brazilians, so they, they've got raw speed, these Americans, but they must be looking over their shoulder at that number one and that number two on those sails behind them, wondering if these girls, USA 92, can hold on to this lead. My guess is that if they win this race, it will be their first ever win in a world championship race. That's impressive. Uh, looks like uh, they've got a, a good little bit of margin there as we have second round will be... Martina Grail, a bit of a split at the bottom mark. And that's the Kiwis coming into play here. The Kiwis are now matching the Italians as the Kiwis go out to the right-hand side of the course. But how long will New Zealand want to keep on going out to that side? Because for Alex Maloney and Molly Meach, that wasn't the paying side of the course on the previous leg. So is it just a clearing sail out on port tack before they clear the fleet? You don't want to tack too soon because there's a lot of bad air to yeah, sail back through yeah, here. There's a lot of traffic. Uh, so it looks like Alex Maloney, Maloney and uh, Molly Meach had a good downwind. Uh, they were at the top mark. They were back a little bit. I see that they've now tacked. So they've actually got away from that gaggle of boats at the bottom mark gate as they, are, they now have tacked. They're coming across on, on, um, on starboard. And that was very close very by those close. Australians that just tacked. And why they're tacking where they, they did, I don't quite know, because anyone that's going out to this left-hand side following the Americans is going out to the side of the course that paid the first time round. Now, Maloney and Meach, are they really in the lead? Um, it may be that uh, the, the wind hasn't fully shifted on our, on our graphics, but it could be that Maloney and Meach have found a winning move there out on the right-hand side, sailing in their own clear air in their, on their own clear line, because anyone following the Americans is struggling for their own lane. Yeah, finding a lane in clear air. Have uh, the New Zealanders managed to just find a nice little patch as we, we're looking at the animation? There's not much in it. But we will just wait for that first cross. Andy's having a quick look out the window to get a, a real look. But the animation is saying that advantage line. When I look at the eyeballing it, I think it's still the Americans looking out the window for me. But uh, we'll just wait for that cross to come up. And there you see the Americans, bottom of our screen, just tacking, just getting across the front of the Brazilians. So the Brazilians carrying on. Further out to the left, Grail and Kunza now the most furthest left of any of the boats. And remember, it was the left-hand side that paid. So the, the Brazilians, possibly they think there's advantage in sailing further beyond the Americans and going all the way out to that ley line. And we're on board with the Brazilians, just tacking here onto Port Tack. And they are pretty close to the ley line for the windward mark second time round. And now the question is... Are they going to be able to overtake the Americans? Well, it looks like uh, left, Marcus' left hand of the track is paying. It, it, it seems to be the pattern is get, a, get around the mark, get through the gate, get over to the left, set up on that uh, port hand ley line. Maybe the pattern is that there's a slight convergence in wind on the left hand side. It gets compressed along the coastline and maybe it's a little bit stronger on the left hand side. Do you think the tower blocks here on uh, the, on the beach could actually be a contributing factor on that? Well, the, 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 with the wind the, funneling around the, 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 the tower beach, blocks? The beach by itself already is, a, is an obstruction that bends the wind a little bit and can create that convergence in the wind. A little bit of a geographic shift is what Marcus is talking about, created by the shoreline. And, uh, as, of course, if you're a young sailor having a look, listen carefully to what's being said. Geographic shifts caused by the shoreline. It's uh, being worked, but it is looking up towards the mark. 
I think Grail and Kunza are in a very strong position here to be able to attack the Americans for first place. The Americans are going to have to judge that ley line coming into the mark on starboard, whereas Grail and Kunz, provided they execute a good tack, don't have that judgment to make. So I think uh, that there's also the question of which is the faster boat. Now, earlier on in the race, it looked like the Americans were faster, but uh, the Brazilians have the experience. They've won the world championships before, never outside of the top two in the past three world championships in the FX class. So with them breathing down the Americans next, I think this is looking very good for Brazil to win this race. And uh, just looking back, I'll put on my Kiwi hat, Molly Meach, uh, Alex Maloney, Molly Meach have got through to third. So they're showing quite good pace. Uh, to get up to third, they were back in the pack a little bit. And they've shown good pace recently at Miami, at my, uh, Miami Olympic Classes Regatta, which they were treating as the build-up regatta for these world championships just on the other side of Florida. So a lot of the fleet have, have used that race as, as a build-up to this one. And uh, they, they, really, they really did extremely well in Miami. There, we're on board with Victoria Yurtsok, Annika Lawrence, the series leaders so far, but they've, we're not talking much about them. Not a good race so far for them. They're down in 12th place, and they just tacked on the left-hand side, uh, not even in the picture on their 3D graphics here. That tack off the line, Marcus, was expensive for them. Yeah, and heading out to the right side was not the right idea, uh, probably. We haven't... Uh, gone fully into the analytics to find out why but my assumption my early assumption is there's just more wind on the left hand side so can Maloney and Meech can they close the gap on the top two it looks like the top two are on a bit of a breakaway but good sailing by the Kiwis well I've managed to sail away from um, from Conti the the Italian number one ranked so uh, they'll be pretty they must have their boat set up pretty I know there's a, a little bit of help goes on between Alex Maloney and Molly Meech and, and Peter Burling has a little bit of input. And uh, Peter Burling being the three-time world champion. Uh, in not, the, not too in bad the, to have a guy saying, um, you know, maybe you just want to try this. Yeah, absolutely. So a uh, strong Kiwi unit there to work with at home. So coming up, uh, there's been a lead change. Yeah, it looks like Grail has overtaken Henken. So the Brazilians now move into lead in this race and have Henken and Scott tacked on the ley line or have they tacked below? Do they have two more tacks to do? If they do, we're looking at the winners of this race potentially. Grail and Kunza absolutely flat trapezing there, working the boat hard, working in unison. You can see how many instructions Grail is giving to her crew there, just keeping her informed about what's going on, saying what the plan is as they are about to bear away around this Wimber Mark. You see them, oh no, they need to tack again. So they weren't on ley line. What's impressive there is how in sync they are with the waves. As the boat was going through the waves, the body motion, the, 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 the kinetics of sailing upwind on a 49 FX, impressive. So that was a bit of a, an error by the Brazilians. Two quick tacks there says that they didn't judge the ley line correctly first time round. So maybe there's a bit of current they didn't take account of. But it's, it's strange that the Brazilians had to do that double tack. But at least they're in the lead and it's very, very tight between the top three. Brazil just about to lead around the mark. And the Americans, have they held on at least for second place? The, those Kiwis are looking fast, breathing down the necks of the Americans. But it looks like these are going to be the top three as they sail down towards the finish now. Bit of a slow set there by Brazil. Will the others be able to capitalize on that? Kiwis go for a low set underneath the Americans. The Kiwis yet to get, the, the Americans yet to get that kite set. Just got the pink kite pulled in, but it flaps again. And that is going to play into the hands of New Zealand, who now must be wondering if they can steal second place from America. So a lead change, and the Americans have uh, just slipped back into the clutches of the, the New Zealand crew as we look back at the fleet coming round. And uh, a couple of German boats there, Marcus at the top mark and we can see the regatta leaders are back in the pack yeah down in 11th place that's victoria lawrence followed by refuse and boyd from canada so not w what uh, victoria yurtsok and annika lawrence would want to see down in the middle of the pack australia coming round followed by norway and it can be quite a hazardous part of the race here getting the spinnaker up if the waves were bigger this is one of the the uh, the danger points in the 49 and getting that spinnaker up but it's relatively light breezes so we are on the second downwind fourth leg uh, we have got grail in the lead uh, taking the lead from the american henkin then the new zealanders are up into third and it is the the uh, the brazilians have uh, marched away 
we can see some grass in the water. Quite dangerous for them to, to sail over that. They, they'll want to avoid those patches. I wonder how much that influences the race. Have you heard anything, Andy? Weed has had been, been a bit of a problem um, for both the 49ers and also the, uh, the NACRAs that are also having the World Championship here. So, yes, yeah, sailing around weed patches is one of the critical things you need to do. You don't want to catch that on your rudder or your dagger board. Meanwhile, Brazil looking very comfortable in the lead now. America with the purple, Jenica on the left of screen. A lot of catching up to do now if they're going to steal back the win, which they've been leading this race for most of the way, but the Brazilians, the more experienced team, look like they are going to take this race win. But well sailed by the Americans to hold off the Kiwis because for a while it looked like they were going to lose second place as well. It's not done and dusted yet, but it looks like America might at least hold on to second place. They've certainly stretched away from New Zealand heading down to the bottom mark on leg four and it is brazil from america from new zealand and the italians who were up there in the top three for a while looks like they dropped back to fifth on that hoist at the top mark and uh, it's the Finns in fourth kurt bay and canerva so a bit of place changing going on behind brazil just jibes the black jenica setting nicely there Andy, just talk to us a little bit about um, the, the strategy as they come into that bottom mark gate. We'll just get around the bottom mark gate. And first in is a Grail as they come in. And then the Americans will set up and, and also the Kiwis are setting up to come into this bottom mark gate. Looks like uh, left hand left hand marker. What I'd, what I'd like you to talk about is in terms of the strategy of race strategy versus the regatta strategy because really if you get anything in the top five you're probably regarded as a counter you're going to you're going to carry that score through you want to avoid having uh, you know a high score on the back of the pack how much does that play on the cruise uh, in, in terms of the race strategy versus regatta strategy um you ask most sailors and they say we just take it one race at a time so um uh, I think they try and think conservatively. They try and think about the bigger picture of um, uh, of what they want to achieve across uh, a whole series, across a whole week. But the red mist can descend when you're in a battle for first or second. There's bragging rights in winning a race. So uh, America will be hurting that they've they've lost the lead to Brazil. But they want to they want to remember the fact that second in this fleet of 43 teams is still very good. So so they probably need to consolidate second rather than try and throw all their chips on the table to try and win back the race from the Brazilians. I, if that's the question you're asking, then I hope I've answered it. I mean, it, there, there can be a, a bit of a difference, but I, I think by and large, if you're thinking strategically, you're just thinking about consolidating your position if you're in the top six or seven. So if you get a counter, you, you, you've got to make sure you can drive that advantage home. And, and in some aspects, when you're back in the pack, Marcus, if you're back in the pack and you can make a recovery uh, to, to a race, you know, to have a race that you can count on your scorecard as opposed to a discard, sometimes that's very satisfying. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's all, I always looked at it as, you know, what's, what's the next leg like or even shorter term? Like, what's the next gain you can make? And even if you capsize, you're thinking positively. You bring it back up and you try to uh, catch up another place. It could count. So, so we put that in the context of this um, race. You, the, you know, your countrymen, the German girls, really, they didn't have a very good start. But it will be interesting to see where they get that. they're climbing up through the field. So they could actually, they they won't win the race. But if they can turn it into something that uh, that's not a discard uh, in terms of coaching, they would be happy about that. Well, and they had a good downwind now, and they're up in seventh place, heading out to the left hand side, which has proven to be the better side. I, I think that's safe to say. And uh, yeah, maybe they so can catch up another one or two boats, and then and it'll be a good race. And uh, you know, you've, you've recovered from something from a bad situation, and that's happening right now from our regatta leaders. We see them right in the foreground at the moment. That's Germany 55 heading out to the left-hand side, and they'll be, they they want to catch up with the two boats that we see in the background. I think it's a Finnish boat, Goodbye and Kanerva, and Dawson and Copeland, a uh, boat from New Zealand, a little bit further back on the. Uh, right hand side and, and really sometimes that makes a difference it's the top crews who will recover from a very bad position in the regatta strategy that Andy was talking about and uh, when, you, when you've done 18, 19 races a, a race like this for the German crew could actually be a telling point yeah. on, uh, at the end of the regatta a absolutely, at the moment by our preliminary scores they're up in 6th place in this race so, so they're, they're, they continue to climb they're pretty much on par at the moment with uh, Dawson and Copeland um, 
and they've got a nice lane where they are now. They look they look in a, a nice lane. They've got clear ear, and uh, when they they tack and go across on on port, they'll be looking to to sail up there without um, anyone on their wind. They'll want clear ear as we look at our regatta leaders. And we should say, as they tack there, they are incredibly close to the shore. I mean, you, they could almost reach out and touch the sandy beach that, that we're on. So they've just tacked there, but uh, it must be extremely shallow where they've just tacked. They're ahead of the New Zealand pair of Dawson and Copeland. And the Germans so this have, is a good comeback, I think, by the German crew. Well, they learnt their lesson. We saw their strategy was to start underneath the fleet, well, to tack early and get out to the right-hand side out to sea. They've realised that didn't work. They paid the price with a, a place down in the teens. But now they've realised left is the way to go. So we're going to go left and we're going to grind out this race and see how many we can pull back. And that's what we see them doing. They didn't quite get the New Zealanders. I was mistaken by another NZL boat. But uh, they, they're right there. See the amount of sea. With. Now that'll be a leftover from the storm uh, two days ago. Yeah, that's right. That's kicked up a lot of this weed, and we saw that New Zealand boat having to avoid that just then. You really don't want to get that round your foils. That is a that is really going to slow you down enormously in such a fast boat like the 49er FX. Take us back up to the front, uh, Andy. What's going on? Any change? It looks like uh, we've got Grail, Henkin, Maloney. Well, top three. It, it, it looks like Henken has learnt from the fact that Grail got further to her left on the previous beat and decided, right, OK, I'm going to get further left than you. Now, Maloney and Meech have gone even further left than that, and you wonder if some of them are even beginning to overstand the ley line and sail extra distance just to enjoy the benefits of getting out to that left-hand side. In a fast boat in the 49er FX, sometimes you ease the sails and you sail a little bit lower, but you're rewarded with enormous leaps in boat speed, so even sailing the extra distance sometimes can be a reward but uh, you're a former European champion Marcus and I think we always differ on this I haven't won a European championship you're not a big fan of overstaying that extra distance is just a uh, too easy way to lose I reckon I, I don't like it at all I but I mean, even when there's a gain feature like it's really quite strongly favored to the left hand side is it not worth hammering it into the corner and, and really nailing that advantage no if you can go high with a really good VMG then then you just don't want to go that extra distance I reckon if there's a lot more wind there's
<laughs> and and also, I I would think that's the case for the Kiwis. Have they yeah. been selected? Uh, well, the way the New Zealand system works after this regatta. The short is after this regatta, I'm sure Yachting New Zealand will be nominating uh, Alex Maloney and Molly Meach. But in New Zealand, the um, Yachting New Zealand, they nominate the team to the New Zealand Olympic Committee, and it's the New Zealand Olympic Committee that do the selection. It's, it's a process as such, but um, I'm sure uh, soon after this regatta, they, they, I hope, they, they, get their, um, they get their nomination. Well, there. I'm sure they will. I mean, they're the standout uh, selection for New Zealand. So most of the... Th- sailors that we're seeing at the front of the fleet know they're going to the Olympic Games already, but some of these teams like those Americans we're talking about have the additional pressure of knowing that they, they've got a selection in, at stake. Let's just talk a little bit about selection. What, what's going on in country selection around the traps, Andy? Uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be up to play with that, being the, the number one dinghy yachting journalist in the world, in my mind. Well, there are 20 places available at the Olympic Games in the 49er and the 49er FX fleets and many of these countries uh, do know that they're going already. It's about firstly qualifying your nation and then once the nation is qualified deciding which team you're going to send to represent that nation. So in the case of Brazil we know it's going to be Martin Grail and Kayana Kunz representing the home nation at Rio 2016. Denmark, they've qualified the nation but we've got a fascinating battle going on between three really strong Danish teams, none of whom, by the way, we ever mentioned in that, um, in that race just then. So um, they, um, th- there's, there's some strange things afoot with, uh, with the Danish racing, which we can come back to at another time. Uh, the Italians, Giulia Conti, Francesca Klapsic, they're selected. Um, the Netherlands, we've got another fascinating scenario that I'll get, we'll get back to if we have time to talk about. The Germans, very many good teams. At the moment, Victoria Yurtsok, Annika Lawrence leading that selection, but uh, this is one of the selection regattas for them. Um, and then they have another one at Palma, Mallorca, later on in the year. So is their selection on points, or, or is it subjective? Is um, there a subjective... Um, it, uh, element. My understanding um, is that the German selection is on points, um, and they they've had some strange um, nominations in the past. Um, I, I think those the nations that have um, selections or um, series purely based on points leave themselves open to some strange things happening, and um, we, we see people match racing each other out of contention some nasty tactics employed sometimes and sometimes someone someone just has some plain bad luck um, that had nothing to do with them if a boat capsizes capsizes on top of you and it wasn't your fault um, it can still take you out of a regatta and and those things need to be borne in mind it seems like and i know from uh, new zealand new zealand used to have a first past the post selection criteria uh, objective if you one on points, you've got the nomination, they've moved away from that. And I understand GBR are the same, that they actually have selectors, they look, they look at a, a series of regattas, because in the end, the end game is you want your best person in Rio. Well, what, I, what comes to mind is one of the coaches here, Hamish Wilcox, coaching um, your uh, world champions in the 49er men's. Pete Burling and Blair Chute will be watching them later on today. Hamish Wilcox, three-time 470 world champion. Tragic story, this one. Absolute. Well, you tell the story. Well, uh, um, you know, um, Wilcox and Barnes, they, they absolutely dominated the 470 world, like Burling and Took in some ways. But when it came to trials time, first past the post... They couldn't perform on I the day. I think they were fourth, weren't they? They were fourth. At, fourth at, in the trials. That at, was how strong New Zealand yep. 470 sailing was and, at the time. And unfortunately, um, they did not get selected. And uh, it, that, actually, that result, thinking back, probably was one of the results for Catalyst for Change. Because I think under the criteria that we have here, to, that New Zealand uses today, Wilcox and Barnes would have gone to the Olympic Games. And four years later, the same thing happened for Great Britain in the 470. We had the the reigning world champion, the reigning pre-Olympic champion, but they were fourth in their trials in the 470, and they didn't represent Great Britain. And in both cases, the representatives that New Zealand and Great Britain sent to those games didn't even come within a sniff of a medal, let alone a gold medal. It's a, it's a funny beast, doesn't it, the Olympic Games? What it does to people, the, the mindset, the pressure. So we'll talk about that later in the year. But um, you were talking about the, the, the Danish selection system. Is, what are they, is this a point system? It's because a point it seems like it's affecting their performances here. It, it does, it's doesn't it? It's to do a bit of a mid-trace. 
I, I don't know if it's a match race. I mean, we have seen um, match racing going on in the the NACRA fleet in um, the, between the Danish um, potential uh, representatives there. So some nasty business going on there in other Danish fleets. But what really stands out to me about the Danish sailors in the 49er FX is that whilst they're rivals for that one slot for representing Denmark at the Olympic Games, they remain the best of friends. And, and it's an incredible team dynamic, dynamic that they have between those teams. But what I, the, the two that I would consider to be the favourites to be going for Denmark are currently well behind the Schutz sisters, who are up in the top three of this world championship at the moment. So it's the Schutz sisters' chance to shine and maybe displace the teams that have consistently been in the, on the podium at previous world championships. Well, um, as we go along during... We're only at day, uh, what, race six. We've got a long way to go and we're still in the qualifying rounds. Uh, that'll be one of the stories I'm sure we'll talk about in terms of uh, the World Championship and how important it is uh, for individual sailors, but also they've got this selection going on, uh, you know, for many people, for their, their world dream uh, to go to the Olympic Games. And it, uh, it, it creates some quite interesting stories to tell doesn't it it sure does it sure does i mean there's so many different layers of the story to tell here so we're just uh, waiting for the second race of the afternoon it'll be race seven of the 49er fx world champs the fx for women they'll be doing three races i've done their first one this morning as we look at the race management team there they'll just be waiting to get underway again out the back you can see i think that's the NACRA fleet, they uh, are also racing at this regatta. I, I, one thing I do like in, in terms of our sport, this, we're talking about the 49er and 49er FX champs, but in conju- the NACRA 17s are here as well. I like the idea of having these a big world championship, lots of people. The boat park is a buzz. It's fantastic. I, I, I must say, I, I commend whoever made the decision to combine the classes. Uh, it is good. And, and if you think back to what a 49er world championship would have been uh, four or five years ago, it would have been just the men here. Now we've got the 49er FX. We've got the women and the men here. And we've also got the NACRAs, where you have to sail male and female together as a team. And I think that was a great innovation in Olympic sailing. And across all of the 26 Olympic sports, there are very few Olympic sports where you have men and women competing alongside each other. The only two that I can think of off the top of my head um, are badminton and sailing. Maybe equestrianism as well, but it mostly because of the physiological differences between men and women, you don't see them competing very much together in Olympic sport. But I think that's one of the, the great aspects of um, of what we've got going on in Olympic sailing. So when we, Marcus, we look ahead to the Olympic Games, obviously the 49er, it's, it's been around 20 years. You you were one of the two Olympics. Unbelievable, it's been that long. I remember you in Sydney, it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, but 20 years, but for the FX, this is their first this will be their first olympiad yeah which which is great uh, in one way and a little bit sad in another that it, that it didn't so happen sooner to catch yeah. up and i remember a few years ago i was at an isaf conference when uh, there was the 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 vote uh, to bring in the class and it didn't come in i was really depressed because i thought wow that's four years lost for for the girls to have fun in such a beautiful boat one of the things that that i often think as an old boy in sailing uh, I, I wonder if it, we, 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 we um, react quickly enough to change. We're seeing our sport, in my mind, is going through a revolution as we speak, a good revolution. Skiff sailing, foiling moths, catamarans that get up on foils, kite boards. And, and I know young kids that I see in, in New Zealand on, down on the waterfront, they look at these boats, the, the high-performance boats, and say, that's cool. I, wanna, I want to look like those sailors. Uh, for me, uh, you know, you, I think you need to react to market change. What do you think? Yeah, I think you, there, there could be a quicker reaction, like we just spoke about with the girls. They were lagging way behind. Um, probably you're right. And the sport, the sport has a lot to offer, but a lot of it is hidden. And the, the challenge we're facing with, with our broadcasting is bringing that to light, you know, showing what the sport actually has to offer. And on the other hand... Uh, on, a, on organizational terms, uh, the sport also has to catch up and, and be quicker. I think it's important because uh, sailing has a bright future, but you make the, uh, need to make the right decisions. And yep. if you bring in a foiling class, I- I'd be very disappointed if they wouldn't bring in a foiling class for the next Olympic cycle. Andy? 
Well, one of those possibilities is the NACRA 17 that we also have here in Clearwater could go fully foiling next time around, uh, but I know there are big concerns amongst the, uh, the current fleet about whether that's going to happen. Will it obsolete the equipment that they've already invested in? That's the other side of the argument. It's easy for us to want to see this change, but who's actually going to pay for that change? Ultimately, it's the sailors and their national bodies. Every time you make a change, it's expensive. It plays into the hands of the wealthier countries because the, the, the poorer countries that we're trying to enthuse about getting involved in sailing can't always play catch up as quickly as the established nations. Look, I think it's, it's good to air these views. You put it out there, get people, if you're listening, discuss it. Put up an opinion, talk to your national body, talk to your club, because um, our sport, we're, we, we, it's our sport. You take ownership for our sport, and if you want change, um, talk to your representatives on World Sailing. We can't pretend that the 49 and the 49er FX are particularly cheap classes, but uh, just look at the way they've exploded across the world and, and how many nations, how many national flags you see represented in that picture right there. It really has taken off around the world. And, and as Marcus said, it's a shame that uh, World Sailing, ISAF, our, um, national, our international body, didn't accept skiffs w for women much earlier on in the cycle. Now we've been uh, filling in between races. It looks like we don't have a clock. Yeah, we do have a clock. Just as I was thinking, minute 50 to go. We are getting set up now for race seven. Race six, we like the left. It looked like it was all the way to the left, ley line to the top mark. What do you think? Well, I'm thinking, what has the what has the race officer done about that? Has he made the right hand end of the line a little bit more favoured? Because there's not going to be much incentive to start up by the committee boat end of the line unless he has moved the course so that uh, it, it's a starboard end favoured line. And, and Marcus, I don't know if you have any input on that, but how does it how does it look on the analytics? It do, it does look like there's a slight bias on the right hand side, and that's what the fleet looks like at the moment. Um, it's quite congested up there. There's still a few boats uh, way above the committee boat, which need to squeeze in there. And that's the Singapore team and Maloney and Meech actually up there on the left-hand side of the screen past the committee boat. Yeah, you don't want to get locked out uh, at committee boat end. So we're coming up to 50 seconds to go. They're in uh, this controlled period where they need to hold position, tuck up towards underneath the, the windward boat, create a gap to lure it so that you can accelerate off the line, Andy. Well, it's interesting to see that uh, well, here we are looking uh, on board with the Brazilians. Now, it looks like they're n somewhere in the middle of the fleet. We've got the Italians down towards the pin end, and we've got the Kiwis up towards the committee boat end. So it'll be interesting to see which strategy pays out. I personally still like the left-hand side, and I fancy that if the Italians get a good start off the pin, I still think that's the way to go. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they can nail that spot. But you see the number one on that Italian sail with eight seconds to go. Looks like there's some way back from the line, the way that we're looking at it. So I'm hoping that there won't be any recalls this time. They're just about to accelerate. The Italians get onto trapeze. They accelerate. But there's a Chilean boat just down to the right of them in our picture. But it's a good start by Italy. Good start by USA 224 in the middle of the course. Very late start by Brazil. They were lagging behind a lot. Very safe start for them, but, but uh, safe, but uh, way behind. I fancy the Italians in this early stage. I think they chose the correct end of the line to start from, and they're going to get into this shore sooner than anybody else. But the Chileans looking very fast here as well at the front of our picture. Certainly the Italians nicely bow forward. And uh, they look nicely launched as they come off the line. And uh, I think if you can get all the way to this port hand ley line, you, you probably take it. And I'd be interested to know who is going out to the right-hand side, if we can have a look at any of those teams. And, and did anyone want to go to the right, or have they been shoved out to the right? That's just, what I'd like to know. Ju just two teams have tacked so far, the Norwegians and the New Zealand team, uh, Australian team, Price and Solly. Uh, all the rest are heading out to the left. Now some boats are getting spat out uh, from that bunch that, that's uh, um, dashing off to the left-hand side. How's Brazil holding up? Because their start wasn't that great from what you said. Uh, currently in sixth position, they're in dirty air, but they want to go left. They keep continuing. They're going way lower than the rest of the uh, boats around them. They're trying to gain speed. So looking good for Italy, the most left-hand boat as we see them in this picture at the moment. The Chileans also doing very well front of our picture sailing in very close towards the shore and if they sail any closer the Chileans are going to have to pull up their dagger board they're getting that close 
So we're on race seven, leg number one. It was Italy off the line. Beautiful start. They started down towards uh, the bottom third of the line. They look to be in a strong position. As the boats now, they are getting close. We can even see a beach marker there. Back on board, uh, the Brazilians, and I got, had the boats confused just before. They actually managed to squeeze out of the start. They're doing quite okay. They're back in the first row of the fleet. The boats behind them nicely lined up. No freedom to tack for them, but they've got great speed. They're really working their way out of uh, that start. It wasn't a great start, but they managed to pinch out, and that is that is a feature that you really want to uh, have in your bag. Well, at the moment, they've got a lane, haven't they? Um whether that closes when they, they'll be looking to... Italians just cross. Just They're cross. in the lead. They're on their lead. As they I don't through. think that the Brazilians could cross at the moment. So, so that's the difference. The Italians had a slightly better start, and that means that they have a much better call on the tactics that they're able to play. So as, as you just said, the Brazilians might be struggling to tack across the Americans and the Canadians if they were to tack there. But look, there's a post there. They're, they're getting really shallow. The Brazilians are getting so shallow that they'll be able to call for water to tack on the other boats. So they tack as USA come at them, Port Starboard. Is this an incident? Ooh, I didn't think so. What about oh, right? Ooh, this one's close. This is very close. <laughs> and they did have they, to bear away. Did. You could you could see that. Will there be a protest situation? As Another result, boat. That's the New Zealanders there as they go across in front. While coming well, across on port, you are the boat required to keep clear. And look at all the boats. They're so close to shore. They've all been forced to tack where they are. There's, there's a post telling you on the left-hand side just how shallow this water is here. But the Brazilians, oh, they've tacked back again. They want more of that. They want to go back in, or are they going to... No, they're going to do turns. They're they're they've been penalised, haven't they? Yes, yeah. they have. It was that port star, but... Oh, that's expensive. That's very expensive. Now, look, uh, Alex Maloney's got a port starboard coming up there. It's like just sneaking through. It looks like it's ahead of Australia. What's Canada going to do? Is Canada going to get, get across? Wow. Possibly. I mean, there's a lot of tight situations there. Meanwhile, the Italians, far out to the left, they haven't had to worry about any of that because their that, start was so good. Their start was good, and the, they, that first cross. And if across you win the, the first cross... You're, you're away. You're launched. You're, away. You're, you're in a. You're in a. You're in a land of your own, and uh, I'd be very, very surprised if the fleet um, can catch up to the current world champions, Conti. And this is where we see the test of the Brazilians on the right-hand side now. Can they come back? Yeah. How much can they salvage after taking that penalty turn? We we talked about it earlier in the in the first race, and Marcus, you know, you look at a mistake, a, a mistake like that, and it is a mistake. The, their start was okay, but that port starboard incident that can be costly. Yeah, I think they they ran out of runway. They had to tack, and 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 tacking back uh, right into it is a very difficult call to make. They they they, they tried. couldn't use it as an obstruction. They couldn't. No, not they couldn't anymore. Call, they no, couldn't no. call for water. They actually uh, they, either had to they, dip or, or, or they tack would back. have had to dip probably or tack back. It was a big dip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good talking point. Race seven. Have the race six leaders. They were penalised. It's put them back. They won the world champions last year. But it's those moments in a regatta, Andy, that that you can. The coaches just pull their hair out, don't they? They're defining moments, but they're also the, moments. They're also the test of of how well can a sailor respond yep. to that moment. And the Brazilians will fight all the way. I mean, they're made of really tough yep. stuff. It's a moment. You can't. It's it's happened. It's gone. You've got to recover from that. And it's some it, the very very good sailors. They do come back from pretty deep positions. And we'll we'll just monitor as we go through. I think they'll still get a top five out of this race. That's that's how I think. I mean, I just think there's such form sailors. And the they Brazilians. got pace. Yeah, they got they got speed. So meanwhile, the Italians they are leading in the early stages, but the. Have they handed a bit of an advantage to the boats on the left, Maloney and Meach and the Canadians and the other boats that are on the far left-hand side of the course? Um, we'll have to see. But the Italians tack there in, in our uh, graphic, and I still think Giulia Conti and Francesca Klapsic, the reigning world champions, are looking very strong for winning this race. Yeah, good start. But Well, not a good start. Brilliant start. Won the first cross. Um, the team that looked like they are second... Uh, uh, Maloney and Meach, they got an, an average start, but it, again, they must be fast because they, they're coming back from 50-50 positions to, to really uh, be in quite a strong position if, if they can convert into the top mark. I think they had a good start, but they, they started at the right-hand end. Oh, here we are. More than, so, a, more than a good first beat. 
It looks like in New Zealand and Canada as they come into the mark. So the the, the power, power of the left. The power of the left. <laughs> <laughs> if you own the left on this course, it looks like uh, you're going to be strong. So lead change at Mark Canada One. Canada in the lead. Canada, New Zealand, and Conti and Klaptich who won the fir- who won the start, won the first cross, but uh, they didn't protect the left and the paid. So we're on board with the Kiwis, and it's. Alex Maloney on the helm, Molly Meach up the bow. Now, interesting, you know, Andy, their two brothers are fighting it out for Olympic selection in the laser class. So they're rivals while they're, those two brothers' sisters are working together for New Zealand. That's a, that's a pretty interesting I scenario. asked them the question. I said, oh, do you talk about it? And they just giggled and laughed at me. <laughs> of course they do. Brazil going round there, well back in the pack, a lot of catching up to do, and they do the jibe set, which is the classic escape move. If you don't like where you are in the fleet, you try something else, you break away from the traffic and chance your arm out on the far side of the course. Andy, how expensive was that port starboard for the Brazilians? If you can, Well, it looks to me like they must be down in the teens, are they? Ten, ten places, yeah. They're down 12th at the moment. What do you reckon it costs them, mate? Yeah. Maybe they could have been second up at the windward mark. No, they, probably they were pressing. If they'd have if they'd have stuck the cross, they were they were going to be right there. Yeah, but I like their breakaway move now. Doing uh, being the first boat to jibe set. Um, there's there's maybe a little bit less wind on the other side, but definitely less traffic, so they can go their optimum VMG. And it looks like they're going nice and deep right now. Well, let's keep an eye on their gain loss. So for, remember for the, the position that we're talking about. They were back in thirteenth at the first mark. Okay. Let, let's see where they finish. Yeah. Can they can they convert a thirteenth, which probably is a discard for them, into into a into a keeper? I think that's their challenge. Monitoring their speed at the moment, they're the fastest boat on the course. They're doing fourteen point five knots, where the others are slightly down on the other side. Maybe that's going to help them catch back up. They might be able to get back into that bunch just ahead of them. Meanwhile, out in the lead, it is the Kiwis. Uh, they won the last race last night. They won in Miami at the World Cup event, the New Zealand team of Alex Maloney, Molly Meach, and um, they're doing pretty well. They, they, it was an a, a better than average start, but it was that top mark power of the left that really uh, they converted along with the Canadians. The Italians might be kicking themselves for not having held on a little bit longer. Maybe they should have, or maybe it was just they ran out of shore. I mean, maybe they were running into the beach, and that's why the Italians had to tack. That was the benefit of what the Kiwis did, starting up by the committee boat, it gave them a longer runway on starboard and enabled them to get further up the left-hand side of the course without tacking. More options. It just opened up a, a, a slightly more option to, for them to get further to the left, closer to the ley line. That's right. And the only way the Italians could have done the same is if they attacked back and done two more tacks. And that's costly. Yeah. What is it? Marcus will know. Marcus, in terms of tacking a 49er, what's that going to cost you? Um, what, what are you talking for a tack in terms of... In, the, in these conditions? Yeah. Three, four boat lengths? Minimum. I'd say... So two? I, I'd say three at least. So that's... They'd have had to do two extra tacks. So this is the trade-off, isn't it? It is. You say, right, will we, will we just lump it out and, and do one tack? Or do two tacks and get in a position? As we look at New Zealand, as they come into the bottom mark gate, and they uh, uh, led... They were second at the top mark, actually, and the, but they've jumped into the lead ahead of Canada. Strategic now, really, with the left being so strong, you're, you're going to protect the left-hand side. Absolutely. In the previous race, we saw the Kiwis go out to the far side and then tack back. But when you're in the lead, you get to dictate exactly what you want to do. So this time, it's the Italians that have to do the Kiwi move. We, we will see the Italians tack fairly soon. Once this traffic has gone past, coming down the run, I'm sure we'll see the Italians tack back because they'll want to protect the left. I think we're going to see the Brazilians going around the far mark. There's and a, it could be they're going around now. And that was a nice move. There's, oh, this is very dicey here for Germany 55 getting around this mark. Have they done that legally? That's very messy. And it's with another German. It's, it's, it's selection rivals in a battle round that mark. Oh, that's a, a messy mark rounding for both the German boats. Oh, uh, that could be an interesting protest. Oh, it looks like some breaking going on right there. Conversation, Marcus? Uh, oh, quite rich, that looks, do you think? That looks interesting. That could, be, that could stir a debate <laughs> later on. 
So that was Victoria Yurtsok, Annika Lawrence, um, having a battle there with the Gerga sisters. The Gergas had a disaster earlier on this week with a broken mast. Uh, interesting to see Grail and Kunze climbing back up to 8th place. I think that was a good mark rounding for them. They headed out to the right-hand side, but not very far. They tacked back, and they're now above most of the boats heading out to the left-hand side. And I, I'd be surprised if they wouldn't go for a long way out to the left-hand side. They've got one boat above them. That's Dawson and Copeland, also from New Zealand. Um, that's covering them, but... That's going to be an interesting battle to see if they can squeeze out. But that's, a, that's already quite impressive uh, to, to come from 13th to 8th on, on one leg. Absolutely. And, and if they can keep clean on this next upwind with um, the New Zealanders just ahead of them, again, you look at the, the very good teams, their ability to sail through the fleet. For um, Alex Maloney and Molly Meach, they're out in the lead. They'll be pretty happy. Erica Dawson, interesting. Erica Dawson and Ali Copeland, they're really the next generation of young sailors. That's uh, key, the New Zealanders, um, 484. The, what's happened in New Zealand, Andy, it's interesting. With Burling and Took, they've created a culture. And all these young kids are coming along and saying, I want a piece of this. And, and Ali Copeland and Erica Dawson are, 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 are really part of the new breed of skiff sailors we're seeing in New Zealand, and there's a number of boys here as well. I think it's fantastic. And, and of course, it's great for our number one team of Alex Maloney, Molly Meach, that they've got a bit of competition. Occasionally, I'm just seeing uh, Martine Grau really work the boat hard with her body. I mean, she's putting every bit of her slight frame into making that boat go fast. Really, really physical sailing. Very unusual to see with 49er helms. Normally, you're, you're quite trying to be just smooth and light around the boat. She's quite vicious with the boat. So when you talk, uh, you know, you talk these dynamics, why are they vicious with it? What are they trying to achieve? What, what's, the, what's the skill uh, that, that you're talking about here with, uh, with the Italian, uh, with, sorry, with the, um, well, you're with the, the Brazilian team? The, the boat is, is constantly accelerating and decelerating as it goes over waves. And, and when you go over the top of a wave, you want to open out the sails. So, so if you work with your body, you can, you can actually um, use the, use your body to sort of break open the top of the sails. So it's like a kinetic, it's a, like an yeah. upwind kinetic exercise. It is. And in, in some of the other um, classes, it's really kinetic. The slower it's the boat, the more kinetics are required. Yeah, and it's certainly been a contention. Uh, it's certainly been a contentious topic in the world of yachting. Change of topic. I went back to that mark rounding to check what, what happened and whether uh, Germany 55 had inside room from the tracking. It does look like they had. They were allowed to go in there. It looks like there was an overlap. That's from the tracking, but it, it looked like all and was clean and safe. And it doesn't look like uh, the on the Rota jury have been, come into play, that we haven't seen any penalty turns, but uh, it, was push, it was pushing hard um, to, get, to get in there. Is there any direct judging going on? Uh, not that I know not of. There, there will be for the medal race. Okay. Yeah, in the medal race. But if you if you admit guilt, you do your penalty turn, and yeah, you're not going to go to the room. Now let's just give a heads up to those Canadians in second because we don't expect to see them up in second. Ariel Morgan and Heather Myatt, a big shout out to them because this is a really solid performance by the Canadians. Uh, they they are in a sandwich between two former world champions, the 2013. World champions Alex Maloney and Molly Meach in the lead, and actually the reigning world champions, I should say, Francesca, sorry, Julia Conti and Francesca Klapsic from Italy. So uh, the Canadians in a world champion sandwich right there, and the, uh, what a great experience for them. Can they hold on to a top three in this race? And, and what's important for young sailors is that if you can get in the top five in a race, in one race in a regatta, there's no reason in the future with more training, more coaching, more experience, you can't do it again, and and it's a it's a great moment for, um, you know, for the Canadian team to get up there and sail with with these people because it it'll give them confidence that they can have a piece in another race. That's exactly right, and the same could be said of uh, the Argentinians in fourth, Victoria Travasio and Maria Sol Brands. Uh, great to see that. Uh, South American teams are coming to the fore in the uh, 49er FX, mostly, of course, Brazil with um, Martin Grail and Kayana Kunz, who are the uh, the favourites in this fleet right well, now. Well, we look at the top six there, and there, there's new names. And, and it's great with uh, with the Canadian team, Morgan and Myatt, and, and uh, Argentina, the New Zealand team of uh, Dawson and Copeland. They're young, 
and it, it's great. And Marcus, in terms of the FX sailing, the fleet, it seems like the fleet is still a little bit inconsistent. It, it, it's it's a new fleet, it's first time at the Olympics, and we are seeing new names coming up. Um, I know the last time I did this with you, it was in um, in Aarhus, the Europeans in 2013. There's a lot of new names in the FX fleet. Yeah, I think the class is still developing. It's, uh, the door is wide open. A lot could happen at the Olympics. We've seen some very impressive performances, uh, some countries being very dominant, like the Danes, for example. Uh, but I think that the door is still open for newcomers to come in and, and show their skills. Which is good, huh? Absolutely. It's good, it's good if a, if a class. class Once a class settles and, and there's the, the, the masters have taken their place, you really young sailors sometimes have to wait for them to go away. Otherwise, they don't have a chance. Alex Maloney and Molly Meach get the Jenica up, leading this race quite comfortably at the moment from Ariel Morgan in, uh, from Canada and then Conti and Klapsic, the reigning world champions, going round in third place. And a bit of a shaky hoist there by the Canadians, not quite as smooth as the Italians, so it's a chance for the Italians to attack. And we're on board, Molly and Meach. Legs crossed. At the back of the boat as much as they can be they've, they've got both of their back legs in a foot strap just to stop them falling forwards if they if they pile into the back of a wave they don't want to be going around the front of the boat they want to stay where they are you look at a lot of the crews and uh you know their coordination and their teamwork is a given but in terms of their their sizes i mean uh, alex maloney she's a tiny little button molly meach is a big girl and and it's all about uh, the, the forward hand, they've got the physical work to go, Jenica up and down, and, and also developing power on the upwind. And so You talked earlier about the ideal cr uh, net crew weight. Yeah, um, you want often, most of that crew weight in the crew, in, ideally, in, in the as, crew. as you do with those Kiwis. And, and you're seeing that in a number of the crews, aren't you? You've got a, quite a, a small skipper helm. and, yeah. a, and a, um, quite a big forward hand. Because yeah, the, the forward hand, well, it's, it's physical, eh? It is. It's a very unfair distribution of work on the 49er or the 49er FX. I mean, the, the helm just stands at the back, steers and shouts at the crew, and the crew is, can barely shout back because they're out of breath. Their, their heart rates are operating close to maximum for a lot of the race. Superbly fit. And there's the series leaders going into today, Germany 55, Annika Lawrence and Victoria Yurtzok, and the Brazilians just going out of picture there. So the Brazilians on the charge. Yeah, they, they're on the, uh, I look here on Sail Track, and this group we've got um, Grail in at 10th. We had them at nine, uh, 8th at the bottom mark, so... After Maybe that, a bit of a drop back After then. that disaster, Port Starboard, they went back to 13th. So they have made a gain, but not as much as I thought they'd make. Jorksok, who are winning, who were winning going into today's race, uh, races, they uh, are sitting there in ninth position. Just about to go into a jibe, thinking about it anyway, but they may not be able to because they got the Brazilians and one of the other boats behind them, but they're going into it now. And just watch how they get straight out onto the new side, really fast through the boat. Stay, stay in the middle of the boat for as short a time as possible because that's when the boat's at its most unstable. And we haven't seen any capsizes yet today. We've seen a capsize in the background of one of the shots um, earlier on in the first race today. Um, but mostly everyone is in good, good control of their 49er FXs today. But in previous days here in Clearwater, the jibe is one of the pla places where boats capsize the most often. Boat handling such a big uh, part of sailing a skiff. And it, it just comes with practice. And uh, I know watching back in New Zealand, the 49er FX and 49er sailors, they spend hours just doing manoeuvres, boat handling, round marks, spinnaker up, spinnaker down, jibing. It, it, it's at a premium in, the, in a skiff discipline. It is. You know, it's money in the bank if you can get those skills squared away. And what surprises me is that there's still quite a gap between the, the, the good and the great in terms of how good their boat handling is. Now, for Kiwi fans, this is uh, pleasing the... Alex Maloney, Molly Meach, they've stepped away. They, they, once they've got um, clear air, they've, they obviously are fast as we look at uh, Conti and coming round the bottom mark in second. But it, the New Zealanders have got a pretty sizable lead. They've stretched on. It appears to me they're quick downwind because in the first race of the day, when they were a bit deep, they managed to come back on the downwind. So uh, the New Zealand got good speed? I, I think that's a good point. I think the reason might be because they are one of the heavier teams. Molly Meach is one of the biggest girls in the fleet, and I think that extra weight downwind can really help you in these full power conditions. So you can convert 
the extra writing mo- moment into speed. Yeah. The, the, the heavier you are, the faster the boat goes. The faster the boat goes, the lower it goes. So you end up being lower and faster towards the mark than, than your compatri- than, than um, other people that are lighter. So heading up when this is uh, for the final time, it is... Um, Alex Maloney and Alex Molly Meach. Maloney up the front. Molly, Molly Me- Sorry, Alex Maloney steering Molly Meach forward hand. Boat looks lovely. Slightly... Uh, Stern down. Beautiful conditions. You wouldn't think you're in winter, would you? Look out the window. It's gorgeous. It's felt, like, it's felt like winter on previous days. Was, You've turned up just in time for summer, Peter. I but wasn't we've been here suffering. earlier in the week, and I must say, I was pleased, but I don't know what you're moaning about, to be honest. You wouldn't it, know it, it today. It was like a typical you, Florida winter day. Typical keel day. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it was uh, certainly pretty challenging on day one, day two. And it did mean that um, not a lot of races w- were put off. And just to recap, we thought we'd be into Gold Fleet Racing today. We're not. We're still in the qualifying phase. The 49er FX, which we're covering now, will do three races. That also means we can't bring overall results because there's an, another fleet uh, sailing later on. And uh, those results will be combined uh, together uh, in the afternoon. But uh, tomorrow we're going to have live results all throughout because the Gold Fleet's going to f- start battling it out until Sunday afternoon when we will see the final uh, medal race, which was so exciting in Argentina, uh, especially with the girls, that uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So the, the schedule looks at the moment. We'll, we'll finish the qualification phase today for Gold Fleet. Tomorrow, Gold Fleet Racing, and then on Sunday, last day, Gold Fleet Racing and medal finding that final medal race. Still got a long way to go. Absolutely. And uh, as we said at the beginning of the show earlier today, there's some unusual names in the top 10. Will those unusual names be able to stay up there? Will some of the others, uh, Eden Nielsen in particular, down in about 30th place, third in last year's world, second in the worlds before that. She always finishes on the podium of a world championship. Is she going to be able to this year coming back from 30th place overall? That's deep. On board the race leader, uh, last night's race leader, uh, um, Jutzok and Lawrence going up wind towards the left-hand side of the course. Uh, one of the smaller teams, so they really have to stretch their legs. They, they need to make use of um, every bit of power they've got available to them. But they've, they've improved a lot. They're really light and, and short compared to some other teams, and they've really improved in the stronger breeze. Very impressive. So that's come, come about, but good analysis, good coaching, lots of time on the water. Definitely, yeah. Max Roy is coaching them, uh, my former uh, crew uh, for the Athens Olympics, and, and he's doing a great job with, with the team, and um, yeah, he's, he's worked hard with them. And it looked for a while that there wasn't much to choose between the, the top three or four German teams, but uh, these ones are really starting to stretch out, and they must be moving in as favorites for selection now for... Rio 2016. It does look like it, yeah, but uh, we'll see in the coming uh, three days. So, and, the, and the process in Germany is is subjective, objective, points? It's points. It okay. is points. It's and, points. And, and it's uh, this regatta for the girls. The boys are not having their qualification here. The, this is the second qualification regatta for the girls, and the uh, third one, I believe, is going to be here or Palma. So it's not, it's not finished It's Palma. Here. It's not finished okay. here. It's Palma. Okay. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sorting that out, German qualification. I've, Andy. I've, I've just for decided for you. <laughs> so we're just talking about it, and, and it's certainly been a talking point. We've talked about a lot um, off air. The, the the country qualifications or nominations to the Olympic Games, it, it just adds another layer of story around this 2016 World Championship uh, here in Clearwater. Yes, it does. There are, there are those that are just racing for the honour of world champion, and for others it's um, it's about doing as well as you can here, but with the bigger goal in mind of, of representing your country at the Olympics later on this year. Let's get back to the racing. So we have the New Zealand pairing of Alex Maloney, Molly Meach. They got an okay start. It was a, probably in the end a good start. They found a lane. They were right in the hunt at the top mark. They got a beautiful little shift out of or an angle out of the top mark on the left. And uh, then on that day, they got good pace on the downwind. Once they got in the lead, they've sailed away. Then Conti, it looks like they, uh, Conti and Klaplich, uh up to second. So that's a good comeback for them, getting round. And then uh, Erica Dawson 
She's up there. That's good. Ki- Kiwis uh, first and third in this race. When you're so. a Kiwi fan, I'm pretty happy about that. And they're a new crew. They're young. And, uh, again, in, in Down Under, we've had this. And I think it's on the back, really, of our men, uh, Peter Burling and Blair Turk. The, the 49... You'd be happy with this, Marcus. The, the, it's, the skiff sailing community is growing enormously, whether it's 49ers or FXs or even the little 29ers. There's lots of young kids sailing skiffs. In New Zealand. Down Under. It's, it's fabulous. So is that like, is the sport getting uh, popular attention throughout the whole uh, um, New Zealand sport fan crowd or? Yachting's always popular. It's, uh, you know, very popular. A lot of awareness. We have a very educated sailing public. And, um, I, you know, Peter Burling, Blair Took, uh, they're the hottest thing in town. And in terms of uh, sportsmen, known sportsmen in New Zealand, I, I can tell you they're right up there and um, they are household names. But we're sports crazy, small population. It's like living in a village, Andy, isn't it, as you keep telling me? <laughs> well, welcome to the wider world, Peter. And uh, we're just seeing Julia Conti, Francesca Klapsic in second place in this race. The Italian world number ones on their final approach to the top mark for the last time. But they've got a lot of catching to do if they're going to win this race because of the Kiwis hoisted their Jenica probably 30 seconds ago. So a really big lead for New Zealand. Argentina up into third there. Travasco and Brantz just about to that, go around. That's a good comeback by Argentina. It's a 150-meter lead, by the way. That's a lot. It, yeah, it, it is, is a lot. One such design. a short race. And uh, Paris Hankin, Helena Scott did so well in the race earlier today, up into fourth. That wasn't a fluke in the first race today. So that's pretty good. And, and Americans coming through strongly. And yes. the Canadians that were doing so well earlier in this race, they're still in six. They have dropped back somewhat, but uh, for Morgan and Myatt, still a good score if they could hold on to sixth in this race. And then a bit of traffic after them. But look at the gap back from the Kiwis, back to the rest of the fleet. 150 metres, Marcus was just telling us, and they are going absolutely flat out into their jibe. Let's see how that jibe goes kite nicely set on the new side and out onto the trapeze and the boat up to speed again already. Now, Andy, in terms of you being in neutral and, and you know, a, a yachting uh, journalist, how do you read this, uh, the New Zealand pairing? Are they in with a sh- obviously in with a shot at the Worlds in terms of the FX world of SX, FX sailing? Where, where do you rate them? Well, they won the 2013 World Championships in Marseille, and um, they, they were very much the standout performers in that first year of FX racing, because it's still a very new class. And then I was sort of surprised that they dropped off as much as they did over the over the next couple of years. They, they haven't really been World Championship contenders. They won in 2013. They were 12th the next year in 2014. They were 8th last year in Argentina so they haven't really shown form in the last two years of being able to win a world championship but then they won in Miami just a couple of just a week or so ago and uh, they won that quite convincingly so it looks like they're, they're finding some form again and um, maybe that's working with Pete Burling and Blair Chuk and and benefiting from the knowledge that that they have from uh, 49er men's racing I know this is a new boat as well. They they freshened up. They had a new boat. They launched a new boat this year, and I assume this is the one they brought up here to Clearwater. Uh, but it's the old confidence thing, isn't it? You get on a bit of a roll. They they won in Miami, and seeing their body language around the boat park, I, I think they've got pace along. Now, they're in the first division of fast, the fast crews in the FX fleet. We've seen it in this race. I mean, they're as fast as anybody upwind. And as you said earlier, it could be they've got a click of pace on other people downwind. And that's one of the benefits of the analytics. We can look at that later on in the day, maybe, when Marcus has had a chance to crunch those numbers. It would be interesting to know who's got the highest, highest average speed downwind. So we're coming down to the finish of this FX race, qualification race number seven. It is New Zealand. Alex Maloney. Molly Meach, they've got a big lead. They've sailed away from the fleet. They managed to get some nice lanes. They got into the left off up that first beat. So they win race qualification race number seven. That's their second win of the regatta. With a 167-meter lead. So they stretched a little bit more down that final run. There looks like one of the 49ers, uh, an American 49er, getting ready to race later on this afternoon. And look how long we have to wait before the next boat comes across the line. Who's it going to be? Is it those Italians, the world number ones? It is. 
Fran uh, Julia Conti, Francesco Klapsic across the line in second place. Good score for them. All keepers. Anything in the top five when you're doing um, what, uh, 18, 18 race regatta, you, they're all keepers. Is Third across is Argentina, Victoria Travasio, Maria Brantz. Very good result for them. And then Paris Henkin, Helena Scutt in fourth. Very good climb for them. They're starting to look world class, some of these, uh, the, the, those American sailors. And a very good result for the New Zealand crew there in as fifth they place. come through, through in fifth place. Canada across in six, good score for them, although we should remember they were vying for the lead in the early stages of this race, but still a very good result. Sixth place for Morgan and Myatt. Norway across the line. That's the race officer's camera looking straight down the finishing line. And Brazil crosses, well, let's see, that is that uh, eighth, eighth, eighth place. place. Eighth place. So, so not too bad considering they had to take that penalty. Jotzog and Lawrence in ninth place. Yeah, so Brazil came back from what what we talk about thirteenth, thirteenth after the Port Starboard um, incident. So eighth is that a keeper? Just it could be. It could, it could, be. could be. It could be. It's good enough to. It's not a disaster. No. And and so those uh, Port Starboard or infringements they can be costly. You can look back at a regatta and go, oh, that cost me. Yeah, and it's, but, it's, but I think an eighth is. is the coach would be going, oh, yeah, no, that's all right. And th th it wasn't a bad error of judgment. They only, I mean, they were unlucky not to get across that well, other boat. it's a boat. tough one, isn't it? You've got yeah. the shoreline coming up. You've tacked. You don't want to tack back because you've got the shoreline again. Yeah. And then you've got a starboard tacker, and you've got to give way to them. Yeah. I mean, they, they tack or dip. No, no, they, they couldn't. Could, yeah, they could have dipped. They could have dipped. Could've but dipped. They, they, they needed to do it a lot earlier than they, I mean, it was a big dip. It was a big dip. But it's, a, it's that 50-50 it's that call. Should we take the risk? Yeah, and then once you committed, and the, the problem with the forty nine er and the forty nine er FX is um, you've got two tiller extensions, and and you've got the the redundant one sitting out to the leeward side of the boat, so it, it's quite easy for another boat coming up behind you to catch that. And sometimes, if someone wants to prove a point, they'll hit it and sometimes snap off the end of your tiller extension just to prove a point. You guys are tough in Europe. Hey? Yeah, yeah. You never do that down under. Well, Ica Martinez, early on in his 49er career, before winning a, a gold and a silver medal at the Olympics, he used to come across on port a little bit too often on start lines, and uh, eventually someone had enough of it and put their bowsprit through uh, through the side of his boat. And, um, yeah, some, sometimes uh, people have to be told. Tight finish down fleet. And we've got the New Zealand team already resting and having a lunch break yeah i rest can see that on their onboard camera rest and recovery is so important um you know to, to get some food on board a bit of fluid we will try and just get to this quite a nice shot with um the new zealand team no it's not the new zealand team i'm looking at sorry but uh in between races talk to us about in between races andy it, you don't just sit back and sort of put your feet up there's normally quite a set procedure isn't there a bit of a debrief bite to eat what are they talking well, about well you, you see an example of it here with the brazilians uh, talking to their coach they'll be oh that's the Bra brazilians i mix it up sorry peter that's all right <laughs> they'll be discussing with their coach what happened um that, that maybe uh maybe the coach will be having words with them about that penalty and maybe they're a little bit greedy trying to get across um i wonder what martin is doing waving that bottle around i'm not quite sure what's going on there um, but uh, it's it's a chance to just check in, also to fuel up, um, maybe take on board some food and uh, some fluids. Fluids, certainly. Um, the other thing is, on previous days, I wonder if they would have been putting it on extra clothing in between races because they were chilly. They were shivering. And you wouldn't believe it to look at Florida today. It looks like classic Florida conditions, but it really hasn't been earlier on but in this week. It could be still a little bit cold outside. I mean, it's beautiful where we are. It's, it's stunning. There, there's it's not much weight to this, this warmth. I mean, it, the air is dry. It heats up easily during the day. But as, as soon as the sun starts going down, it's, it's it actually cold. gets no, cool again. It, it was cool last night, and um, I'm not sure what the water temperature is here. It's about 12 degrees. So it's quite cool. Yeah. So, so out on the water, it, it, you know, you are chilly. But between races, you know, they come alongside, they talk to their coach about good and bad and, and uh, condition change. Do, do we need to recalibrate the boat if there's a condition change or wind strength? Um, hydration and food. Yeah. And warmth. 
so there's normally it's quite structured, isn't it? It's not it's not random. You just the, go along. well. There's also the opportunity to change the rig because you, you can't do make many changes to the rig while you're racing, um, but they can get spanners out. They can they can change the tensions in the wires. The 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 the, the windier the race, uh, the windier the conditions. Generally, the tighter you you want to run the wires that uh, hold the mast into the boat. Because that helps to flatten the uh, bends the mast, it flattens the sails. Flatter sails are better for stronger winds. But if the wind was getting lighter, you might want to loosen the rig a little bit. Those kind of things that you do with spanners, you can't do in racing. So here we go. This, uh, these are preliminary results. We've got New Zealand. It's Alex Maloney, Molly Meach. The Italians are second. And then we've got um, Argentina. A good day for the Americans. Henkin and. Uh, the, you know, the surprise to me is that, that second New Zealand crew, they have really jumped up and uh, they, I know their coaches will be very, very happy to see that New Zealand crew jump up there into, into fifth. Morgan and Myatt. And uh, there's a Norwegian, the Norwegians in there, uh, Martina Grail, who's one of the favourites uh, to come up, Jokesok. Not as strong, the no, Germans, no, as no. they've been earlier in the regatta, Marcus. What, what, um, your thoughts yeah, on your? Yeah, it, it, it is fully powered conditions, and when they're on the small matter, side, eh? If, if, and sort of medium conditions, I think, are the most challenging. If you're a little bit lighter, if it gets stronger, everybody's overpowered, then it becomes easier again. Um, and there were lighter conditions b before. I think probably challenging uh, conditions for them, and I think they're still doing well for them. I think that's exactly right. I think it's these kind of full power conditions where Maloney and Meech can, can make that extra weight uh, work for them, both upwind but particularly downwind, and it's maybe where Jurtzok and Lawrence are going to suffer the most for being one of the lighter teams. Further down fleet, uh, more New Zealand teams, Peter. Uh, Lloyd and Alex and Price and Solly, or no, Australian. they're Australian. Oh, that's flag. Australian. You know, one, that's one of the worst things. You know, that's, away. that's yeah. intriguing. Very contentious because in, we're going through a, ch a possible change of flag in New Zealand for no exactly way. why you did that. Oh, really? Because you look at that Australian flag, the New Zealand and flag is very similar. And what it's going to look it, totally different. To totally what? different. Sil oh, right. Silver oh, fern, isn't it? It's, there's well, a bit it, of silver fern. There's in a bit there. of silver fern, bit of Southern Cross, bit of black because you know the so it's New the Zealand all black. The worst thing I could have said. So yeah, you Austrians always mix up. <laughs> these uh, <laughs> these Antipodean. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very F. What, it is, sorry, sorry to anyway, jump in. Anyway, in 12th place, Gerga and Gerga sisters from Kiel, actually, from Germany. Uh, we need to work on that flag a little bit too. Uh, 13th is uh, French team, correct? Uh, yes, it is. Bossard, Canada in 14th. Uh, Chilean uh, team of the Gamuccio sisters. In 15th. And Singapore, 16. And the Finnish team, Kurt Bay and Kanerva in 17th, and another German team in 18th place. Good, re good result there for the Singaporeans. Um, it could no. be. I, I, I don't know enough about them. Not, I mean, nor do I, but uh, I'm just saying. No, they've done to well see, To see a single, have they? They've done yeah. well before. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that uh, before. But again, isn't it great that we're seeing these Asian countries and man, China in, in sailing? Watch out, especially in the women's disciplines. Yes, absolutely. Um, they won their first sailing gold medal in a, in a sitting down boat, uh, laser. laser radial, yep. at London 2012. Um, they won windsurfing gold in <laughs> Beijing 2008. You yep. call it a sitting down boat. Well, the Aussies always they when when uh, facing backwards. When when GBR <laughs> won lots of lots of medals at uh, the uh, the 2008 games, the Aussies said, "Oh, you only won them down in the sitting down sports, in the rowing, the cycling, and the sailing, <laughs> the sitting down sports." We're a bit the but same. <laughs> We're a bit the same. <laughs> rowing, sailing, kayaking. <laughs> they're not only are they the sitting down sports; they're also the technical sports. Yeah. They're the the, the, the ones where it's man and machine coming together, so uh, maybe it, it, it says something about the science that goes into some of these programs as well. Now, what we should do, if we can, if I look along to the boys, I wonder if we can do an overall point score. No, we no, can't do that at the moment. I've got it in the analytics, but there's really no point because, Be because the, other, of the, fleet, fleet, the okay. other fleet hasn't sailed no. yet. It's quite interesting. Maloney and Meech, having done um, uh, an extra race, are still uh, in second position. Um, so that's how good their scores are. Yeah, so th they're doing quite well still. But so uh, they've really been the movers today, haven't they? They've uh, with a, well, a one and a three that 
Uh, right now, they're winning the day. Actually, Julia do, Conti must have done all right. We do have results from the other course already uh, in our overall leaderboard, but not from this race. Right, so, right. Uh, so it would be unfair to go to full points. Well, Schutz Sisters overall are looking really good. They uh, they had a fourth in the first race yeah. uh, on the on the other course, um, but no point in having overall results now with uh, with fleets not having all the races. But in. we will come to you. Uh, later in the day with um, the results for the 49er uh, FX. On this course, we've got one more race, uh, and that'll be race eight. Uh, remember, for these fleets, we've 4.25 to go. Thanks, Andy, for just reminding me the clock's running. So remember, there are two fleets racing, so that's the dilemma with the points. We've got the fleet that we're covering, but there's also another fleet, Andy, out there, and then at the end of the day, there'll be another split to gold and silver fleets for the finals. That's right, and that's the critical moment, is to make sure that if you're on the cusp of one or the other fleet, you really want to make sure that you break through in the gold fleet. What's that number? Um, I think it's 25. 25, that's About what i About 25. Say. And we will see a flurry of protests this evening <laughs> between boats around the uh, the 20th to 30th mark because people will be pushing every moment. It's why we see the Brazilians having to take turns because some of the t some of the other teams might be on the cusp of that uh, 25 cutoff, and so it's always a bit fraught in the protest room in the evening at the end of qualifying. Well, we will just wait. 3:20. If you're just joining us, we're covering the. 49er FX racing here in Clearwater in Florida. We're just um, up the road from Tampa, St. Petersburg, beautiful, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, early in the week, the conditions were atrocious, to be honest. It blew reasonably hard, but more importantly, the waves were uh, just unsailable. It was dangerous. Uh, good racing yesterday. Perfect champagne sailing today. And, uh, Andy, we've had two good races this morning. We've got one more for the FX very shortly. And then later on, we got four races with the men's 49er. Uh, and I'm joined in commentary here with uh, Andy Rice and Marcus Bauer. And I, I want to ask you this time, Peter, based on what we've seen in the first two starts, we don't know yet um, how the line is lining up relative to the wind, um, but we saw different starting strategies. We saw Julia Conti uh, come off the left-hand end of the line and take the early lead. Uh, because we know that the left pays, but th we saw the Kiwi start at the committee boat end of the line, and okay, that means they're not into the left quite so soon, but they could get out further onto the left without tacking. They weren't reaching the shore, and s so the Italians then gave away the lead further up the uh, the course because they were further to the right of the Kiwis. So do you take the lead early and accept that maybe you have to do extra tacks, or do you start at the committee boat end, which means you maybe only have to do um, two tacks for the whole beat? Well, if you can pull it off, because it's going to be more congested. And if, if you, it's all about finding a lane, isn't it? And and I think that's what um, well, happened in that race too. That uh, Meech, uh, Alex Maloney, Molly Meech, they they started up towards the top. They found the lane. But if you, if you get pinned out at the top end and you can't get there and you've got to tack away, that's a disaster. What am I thinking? I'm thinking probably middle, bottom third and, and try and be bow forward. Well, your Kiwi girls aren't thinking that way because I They're see two New Zealand <laughs> flags right at the top. So yeah. it looks like there's going to be a duplicate start there for the uh, for Alex Maloney and Molly Meach. And if they can get a good start off the committee boat end, they'll be Slightly able to... Slightly higher risk, huh? I, I think I so. Think, I think it's higher risk because the reward is good. But the risk is also high. So the old risk-reward equation, which uh, we talk about a lot. So coming up to 105 to go, the, the boats are lining up. We've been talking about pre-start strategy. Um, we'll we see the flag come down very shortly. The red and white flag on the committee boat comes down now. So we've got a minute to go. And we see the Brazilians lining up pretty much in the middle of the fleet, as we did last time. We see the Kiwis on the left of our picture up by the committee boat. The boat that I can't see yet is the Italians, and I wonder if that's because they fancy starting out of the pin, and maybe they're out of picture at the moment. But are the Italians going to go for the pin? I still think the pin is the way to go. I think it gives you that early advantage, and maybe the Italians will learn their lesson if they do the same, that they still need to tack back and keep on protecting the left-hand side of this course. 20 seconds to go. And 20 seconds. I, I think finding a lane, being able to go straight, you do... If, Tack away, it's the kiss of death. It is. It, on on you this need course, a lane. You need a yeah. lane. You, 
you need to get over to the shore because uh, there seems to be a bit of a geographic shift off the beach. Coming up to seven seconds, take us in, Andy. Just the last few seconds to go, and they will accelerate very shortly. They don't want to be over the line because they would have to go back. Good start by the Australians down at this end of the line, and good start by Victoria Yurtsok and Annika Lawrence. And up on the far side, looks like the Italians have got a Beautiful really good start, start out of the committee boat end, and Brazil coming out the middle also with a great start. So Italy and Brazil with very good starts, and Australia down near the... Uh, the bottom of our picture also a great start but they will be hitting the beach soonest if they um, if they carry on the way they are well you talk pre-start and I, it, for me the teams that have really bounced off there is Italy Conti and uh, Grail midline and they and got their ti- they got their timing right didn't they they got their timing right what's also impressive is that Conti and Klapsic have changed their strategy they did really well on the previous start but they saw that Alex Maloney and Molly Meach did even better out of the committee boat end we're on board here with Martin Grell and you can see that bodywork I was talking about earlier she's really mobile going back and forth you don't see that so much on a lot of teams so, Ma- Marcus how did you read that start I mean it's it, it's I thought it was big a big separation, you know, the fa- fa- midline and one right up at the boat. Yeah, I'm surprised that uh, Conti managed to to uh, jump out like yep. that coming from the pin end, but uh, she does seem to have a slight speed advantage. I look at the data in a minute. Um, but nice start on her and the majority seems to agree that the left side is the place to go. Yeah, anyone that's tacked away onto port, I think it's a clearing tack. Yeah. Yeah, they got sped out, and boats are tacking back onto the left-hand side. So the, the Aussies will be sailing as far as they dare before their foils hit the bottom, because they probably, they, they'll be wondering, can we tack and cross, can we tack and cross? We want to carry it into the beach as far as we can and encourage the others to tack when we tack. So Australia 41, Tesloid, Catlin Elks doing extremely well in these early stages, and up on their shoulder... They will be looking at the German boat and the Brazilian boat. There go the Australians. Will they try and cross? It looks like they're going to duck, but they don't have to because Yurtsok and Lawrence also tack. And Brazil, how long will they carry on? I think Brazil will carry on, but that's good for the Australians. Yeah, they've got a lane, so the Australians came across with the lane down to Lourdes. Yurtsok, the German team, again, they're having to thread the needle as both boats come through on port. They are the giveaway boats. Now we've got this intersection with the Italian team. That'll be a dip by both Yorksock and the Australians. Nice battle going on right there. Out of picture, the Brazilians have now tacked They're the furthest left-hand boat, so it's looking good for Brazil early on. Yorksock and Lawrence managed to squeeze out. That's quite impressive, I think. It d- did look like Australia would roll them. Well, I think those the, when both boats dipped two boats, it, it, it evened it up. And uh, but both boats are in clear air. I think the Aussies are a little bit higher than the Germans by the look of it. Sailing a little bit higher, maybe the yep. Germans sailing a little bit freer. I think they were worried about them rolling them and then, then they just uh, hit the paddle. So good for them, but I think we're going to probably see the leaders come out of the far left. And so uh, that would be uh, below our screen as, as we're looking at it now. And it looks like the Italians and the Brazilians are both doing very well on the left. The boats that uh, tacked away early are not on that lay line. It looks like they're looking at that animation. The, the group that are far left could well be overlaid as they come up to the first mark. Race 3, it, FX it, it does look like they went awfully f- uh, far, and, and that's uh, an advantage for the two leading boats there. Yeah, they'll that, jump away. Yeah, <laughs> they'll have a lot less um, uh, it, tractor cover. Not looking so good for Maloney and Meach at the moment. They're sailing out to the left, but they're not in that front pack, so I'm not sure that that start worked out too well for them. But that's that high risk. Yeah. High risk, low risk. You get it wrong, you you pay. And uh, again, we've talked about recoveries. Maloney and Meach right now uh, are back in the pack. We'll see where they go around Mark 1, and we'll, we'll monitor if they can come back through the pack. We've well, seen. we know how fast they are downwind. Will they be able to make that pay? Will they do the jibe set that we saw the Brazilians do, which takes you away from the fleet and gives you clear air? And in some ways, when you're deep, you've got an issue, you're, but you're one of the, the front runners. When you're deep, it's those recovery races that um, uh, can be so beneficial at the end of the regatta. We'll sit here Sunday night saying, oh, you remember first day? We came back from the dead. We've seen certainly the German team and the, the Brazilians come back from being in pretty deep positions. We'll see if the Kiwis can do it. So 
Tess Lloyd Catlin outs from Australia leading this race at the moment from Jotzok and Lawrence and those are the two boats we're looking at there and it's very very close between the Germans and the Australians yeah the Australians will have that advantage though of being closer to the mark they're the windward boat so well Simo tack though they can they can pick the ley line really yeah as long as they're on the ley line the Australian Lloyd Nelks they'll they'll be ahead Jotzok and will be second I assume they're on that ley line there's the top mark oh there's someone dived Bra- in it it's Brazil Brazil Power of the left, again. Yes, worked you, out well for Brazil. You leave it open at your peril, I think. And will Brazil be able to hoist over the top of the Australians? The Australians are fast getting their kite up, but it looks like Brazil's going to be able to take their air and move into the lead. And the danger for the Australians is will they be rolled by the Germans as well? I think they will, won't they? Well, it looks are like they, they might have got away with it. They've got their clear lane, but they've had to concede first place to Brazil. So it's the world champions from two years ago. Oh, no, oh, they the Aussies a, are coming back. They're having a piece of uh, grail from Brazil, the Australian, typical Australians. You think they're down and out, and they're not. They punch you in the nose. Well, a Kiwi would know that better than anyone, I guess. It's been full on in New Zealand at the moment. I've got to say, there's a, a cricket, you know, we cricket against Australia. There's a test, and uh, let's say there's just been a bit of... Uh, a bit of banter going on. That great international game of cricket. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're, on board the Brazilians. Still hard for Brazil to pull out from underneath the Australians. How are the Australians going to get them this time? I think they're going to roll. Will they roll from there? If they can get just uh, a roll on and a wave? You'd think so, but the Brazilians are holding on and they're going to go for a jibe anyway. So have they jibed earlier than they wanted to? That's the question. I think they have. I, th- I think the Brazil- Brazilians felt they weren't going to be able to hold on forever. But interesting to see the Germans jibe straight away as well. Aussies going for a jibe now. Maybe they're over ley line. Have they sailed too far? Let's, we'll find out a little bit further on. Marcus, it, in terms of uh, you talk about downwind angles, you know, the apparent wind on these skiffs is so far forward. It looks like someone's going to roll over the top, but the apparent wind is on the forestay. And, and that was a graphic example of that, wasn't it? How yeah, but the Australians you, nearly had a piece of them, but they needed to, to push forward a little more. You, you need to cross that, that right angle line to, to get a piece of them and to, to get the advantage on their side. It looks like they really have to luff up. I think that move by Grail was, was advantageous. It could be. It's hard to tell at the moment, but have the Australians sat a little bit further than they wanted to? Are they struggling to make it back to the bottom gate? It does look like it. It does look like they have to pinch a, a little bit to make sure they, they can make it into the gate. So it looks like uh, Grail and Jorksock, they, they beat them to the punch there, Andy, at that, uh, that first jibe, and the Australians have just made a little bit of an error if they have to squeeze to get up to the I think it's still left-hand gate. Have they still, still too early to say. Still too early to say. The Aussies might still be able to pull it back from where they are. If the breeze increased any more, then the Aussies would be in trouble because then they would be sailing lower of the, uh, the ley line to the mark. But we'll wait and see. Oh, here they come back together. So, no, no, there's a jibe in as... The, the we look at um, Grail. I've jibed. And it looks like they might just get round ahead of the Aussies. Just about. Nice move. Yep. Nice crew work. As they now head up wind, so it is a lead change on lead two. Good crew work there. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, really nice to see that. See the work involved in uh, just getting ahead of the Australians. There. Really. Really tight. And that sort of just shows the, the crucial moments between, you know, we've got a world champion here and, and Lloyd and Elks from Australia. They're, again, one of these developing crews, Andy. It's, a, it's at those defining moments at intersections, mark roundings, that really separates the, the very top crews from, from the, the crews that are trying to get into the first it's the division. Small, it's the small differences, Doing isn't Doing the it? small things, eh? And so we always see the Brazilians there or thereabouts, but we're seeing them do battle with lots and lots of different teams that are having their moment in the sun, but they can't always put those moments together. So we, we've been impressed by the Americans, um, um, Henkin and Scott. Uh, we saw the Canadians threaten earlier on, and now we see Lloyd and Elks come into play for the first time. But none of these teams at the moment are able to put it together as consistently as some of these world champions. Meanwhile, out, out on the far side, Conti and Klapsic look like they're threatening. They went out to sea. No doubt they'll be tacking back fairly soon towards what we all know now to be the favoured left-hand side of the course. Well, the left-hand pays uh, at the second half of the beat. When we look uh, early on in the beat, it looks all right in the right, but... Um 
I, I think it's a false illusion as we look here at Grail. Always at full stretch, really. I mean, they make it look so easy, but to keep the boat as steady as that is really not that, it's, it's not that easy at all. And just working her body again, just adjusting her trapeze height, looking around, just checking in on what the wind is doing, where the mark is, where the competition is, in between times, working the body over the waves, telling her crew, Kayena, that she's about to tack. They run through, just dip that wing in the water. Boat really slows down through attack the 49. And now, can they cross the Australians? Can they avoid that penalty of early? Yes, it's an easy cross, so no problems this time. 20 meter lead, uh, according to the data, so they, they just passed by a couple of boat lengths. But how have the Italians done on the far side of the track? That's the question. And now that cross is coming up with the Italians. Let's see how that cross pans As we out. Look at the, I, I think the boat on the left is... Uh, if we look at the animation, the advantage line is just accelerating so quickly as they come across. And the, the Grail oh, yeah. has got a good, uh, good lead over Conti. And in fact... The, the cross that will be interesting, I, I think they'll be ahead of Lloyd and Elks will also be ahead of uh, the Italians. So power of the left again. It's become a bit of a one-way track, hasn't it, Andy, um, in, in terms of where you want to be for the... Where, where you want to be, ideally. But, if you can um, get there. Yes. If but, you can get there. But knowing that it is a one-way track, do you sit in the bad gas of the boat in front of you or do you break out to the right like Conti and Klapsic did to, to make sure that you maintain your clear air for longer? That's, that's one of the challenges that you have if you're further back in the fleet. But the, the problem with that is that it plays into the hands of the leaders and that old sailing cliche, the rich getting richer. And, and we've seen that. We've seen that in the, certainly in the second race where the New Zealanders jumped out. But they're a bit deep at the moment. They're down in um, 11th or 12th. Uh, the, it, starting, starting is so important, isn't it, in, in relatively short races, well, starting first cross. Well, especially so when it's a left-hand favoured track, because if it's a right-hand favoured track, at least you can bail out on Port Tack out to the right. You've really got to hold your lane all the way out to the left-hand side with this course. If you get spat out early on, then you're fighting for air. So we are in the final race for the 49er FX here in Clearwater. We've had three. This is their third race. This is the last race of the day for the FX. Later in the day, of course, we're going to go to the 49ers, so stay with us. As the boats come up to the top mark for the second time, we're doing six laps. Well, six legs. Six legs. Three so laps. Like three laps. So this is the coming up to the top mark for the second time. And it is Brazil in the lead, looking comfortable. And just in the back, you can see some of the 49ers just uh, looking at, at who's doing well and why they're doing well. Some of the men doing a bit of homework in advance of their racing coming up shortly. The Brazilians just about to bear away. The Australians still not far behind them. Kayana Kunza runs in, hoists the Jenica. This is why they work out in the gym. There's a lot of load involved in hoisting that Jenica. It doesn't look like it the way she does it, but... That's why they work out. How long have uh, Grail and Kunza been um, a team? Uh, th since they seem to have been around a while now. Since the beginning of the FX, really. Okay. So, so at least three years. The whole of this Olympic cycle. How important do you think is longevity in terms of partnership? How, how strong is that a factor in terms of uh, when you look at results? I, I think mean, it's we talk a lot about the, the skippers, you know, the skippers. But it, actually, it's the team. And, and I look at uh, Grail and Kunza. I mean, such a vital role for that crewing um, position. Yeah, and, and if anything, uh, when we've seen changes of partnerships, we, we often see it's the crew that is the, the consistent performer. Uh, in the 49er, there's, there's so much load on the crew in, in terms of their input into the boat that uh, some would argue that the crew is the more important half of the, the partnership. I mean, it's, it, 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 I think it's a fairly pointless discussion. The fact is that uh, the helm and the crew are so important to each other's success. So it's, it's, it's one. It is. It, it is a true partnership. And, uh, 
their names, Jork, Sock and Lorenz, they're, they're the same. They, they were certainly together in, um, when we were in Aarhus in 2013, Europeans. Yeah, they were. They've been together from day one in this class. and uh, In the 470 before that? Yes, they were. Oh, so that's a, a long partnership. I mean, often we talk, uh, how many hours does it become, if you're good enough, to become a champion? Is it 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 hours? And it's, uh, they they rack up a 10, lot of hours. 10,000 if you want to become a master at something. You've got to go through 10,000 hours. That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of time on the water if, uh, if you're not cheating your hours. Yeah. But some adapt quicker than others. And uh, Pete Burling, he got very good very early on in his career, didn't he? He was representing his country in the 470, age 17. Yeah, with Carl Evans. And Big overtaking manoeuvre going on right now. Jotsuk and Lawrence passing the Australian team. Well, that's, a, a, again, a crucial point, possibly. Lead change. And uh, Lorenz, uh, 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 Lloyd and Elks looks like they've been rolled by Jorksop. And it's those small moments. It was probably after that jibe. Uh, and, and we see the, the teams that are developing and learning the trade uh, uh, up against the, the really first division teams. It's those small things, mark roundings, jibes. Downwind, it's quite easy for even newcomers to go pretty, pretty much the same speed in a straight line, but these manoeuvres are, are the key moments, really. Bottom mark gate for the last time. They come round the gate, they'll go up to the top mark, down to the finish as our race leader for race number seven. They go in. Grail. With a good lead. Solid it, lead. It looks like about eight or ten boat lengths now. It's a bit like the previous race. The rich get richer. The boat, leading boat gets out. It's uh, this one's turned into. Uh, I mean, the defining moment for me on the downwind, uh, downwind really, is the German team rolling around the Australians. That's right, which they've done very effectively. And and uh, just look how slow the Australians are around that mark. I mean, the boat really slows down as soon as you drop the Jenica, but you don't want to drop it late. If anything, you want to drop it early, but uh, you just see how much the boat slows down. We'll watch it with the next boat as that goes around. It's the Italians, um, Conti and Klapsic, getting the Jenica down now. And uh, the boat slows down. And those last couple of boat lengths are, are, are agonizingly slow. And by the way, this overtaking manoeuvre by uh, Jotzok and Lawrence uh, brought him ahead of uh, Grail and Kunsten, the overall results again. They're, they're in fourth and fifth position right now. Um, that, was, that was a very so valuable it's a move. It's, it's a, a, a valuable move and, and a really valuable point as we look at going into today's racing, the regatta leaders. Yeah, they are. Not the regatta. Yeah, yesterday they were. Yesterday, go, going into today. And... They're going to be happy enough with their day. They, I think it's fairly impressive. I mean, these are not their prime conditions to sail in. We talked about medium full power uh, conditions being a bit difficult on shorter and lighter teams. And they're doing great. So what is their, what's their optimum uh, range? I think they're doing, what are they like? They've got really good boat handling, so they do well in strong winds. They yep. don't have a problem sailing the boat around the course, even in survival conditions. And they're, they, they're really, they sail smart and fast in light conditions. So this, I think, is probably the challenging This is the crossover for I, I haven't talked to them for a while, in a while about th their favorite conditions, but I would think that this is uh, uh, a little bit more difficult for them. Okay. I, I don't think the Brazilians are that heavy either, are they? I think they're on the lighter side as well. So we're see seeing two fairly light teams sail very well in these kind of conditions. Well, and you'd have to say in terms of the, the, the overall, they're very evenly matched. It looks that these, way. The two teams. You wouldn't normally say that. I mean, you would normally say that the Brazilians were head and shoulders above the Germans. I, ju I just think the Germans are really coming into their own this week because, I mean, their, I think their previous world championship results were 8th and 12th. So what's changed? What, what's happened over the the European winter, that they've turned it round? It, maybe, maybe they're one of those teams that responds well to the pressure of a, of a trial. Maybe now that the chips are down, this is where they've got to perform and, and stand out head and shoulders above their German compatriots. Some people crumble under that pressure and some people rise to that pressure. And, and you want someone going to the games who rises to that pressure because that's what you're going to have when you go to Rio 2016. So we're heading up towards the top mark. We're about halfway up the third time up. The Windward Beach sets six leagues, of course. And it is Grail and Kunza ahead. Jerksock from Germany second. And 
I'm sure on the final day, these two crews were going to be talking about a lot. Um, I have no doubt they'll be in the medal race, in my mind. I'm sure that's right. It'll be yeah. a big surprise to see either of these two. Oh, they'll be um, there, along with the, the Italian pairing and probably the Kiwis. But the other side of the draw that we haven't seen, because there's, there, there's other racing going on on the other side of the draw in the FX, is uh, the Danish teams. They must all be on the other side of the draw. Here's um, Alex Maloney, Molly Meach. They didn't get a very good start. We were just going to monitor how have they got on and as the race went on. I know they were in the teens at the beginning. Uh, they will be fighting hard to try and recover enough to, to be a keeper. You don't necessarily want to have... I don't think they've had a drop race yet, though, as Andy just gives me a bit of a heads up. Um, Marcus gives me a heads up. How, how are they looking through the races, Well, they're, Marcus? they're, they're currently down in 11th place right now. So right now, that'll be a drop. Be a drop that that, that will be their drop, right. And just in terms of the points... How many drops? You get two drops in the in the 49 EFX. One in the qualifying. One in the qualifying. One, quali one in the so actually, providing there's enough races. So to burn up your first drop on the last race for the New Zealand is probably not a bad thing. Yeah, I, and, and it's not. It, they'll maintain their lead anyway. Uh, currently, they they've got 24 points, and the Schutz sisters from Denmark have 24 points as right. well. But they've got one more race to and, go. And and they're looking at those points. They got a 13 drop. So. Uh, We'll collate those um, overalls later on when we've got all results in also from the other course. So at the top mark for the final time, Martin Grail leads, solid lead, Andy. Really, really nice, easy lead. I can't see them giving it away now. And the Germans, they've also got a pretty nice lead on the Australians. So the Australians clung on as well as they could, and third across the line for Lloyd and Elks would still be very good, but uh, these top two teams are in a different class. This is the uh, first time I've seen this one today. It's the, the drone. Tell us about the aerials that uh, you're doing here, Marcus. Um, yeah, well, that, that, is, uh, that is a nice chase, it, by the way. It's <laughs> nice. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these these drones are coming, uh, becoming more commonplace all the time, and they give us beautiful fo footage. And I think they're the key to to making our sport more accessible. One of the keys, probably. Well, that's a great shot, and I'm you know looking at uh, comment on setup twist. Uh, it, well, it it is what it is. You um you ease off the vang. You put as much twist in the in the mainsail as you can. Uh, you still see that the boom is very center lined um, because they're generating so much apparent wind. The wind is actually still um, coming on the front of the boat. So it's um, even though the wind, the true wind is blowing behind them, the apparent wind is is actually still in their face. It, it's one of the. It's really difficult to describe the, to the uh, new generation of sailors, so apparent wind sailors. You know, yeah. You and I looked over our shoulder. These guys, it's always yeah. it's always hitting them in the nose. You yeah, know, you're, you're not looking over your shoulder at these boats no, no, for where the wind you're, is coming from. You're looking from. ahead. Yeah, and, and here they go for the jibe, and a sprint through the cockpit there for Martin Grail straight out onto the new trapeze. Quickly followed by Kayana Kunz. Kayana Kunz has to jibe the spinnaker as well, which is why she's always a little bit later out into the new side than the helm. But that could well be their final approach. If they've judged their ley line correctly, they could go straight across the finish on this port jibe. And so possibly no further maneuvers for the leaders in this race. 110 metres lead over Victoria Yotsok and Annika Lawrence. I think, uh, for me, this race is pretty pretty impressive by the two leading crews, the way they started, uh, and, and then they've engineered the race. The Italians, we've, we were talking about them earlier. They got a good start from the boat end, but they couldn't convert it. No, no, I, it's a little bit strange. Are I, they off the pace? I just wonder that. I just wonder if they don't have that great pace. They're just sailing well. Um, but, yeah, I, it looks to me like... Uh, Grail and Kunz and possibly the Kiwis are the fastest boats out here. So coming down to the finish, it is Grail and Kunz. Comfortable lead. They took the lead on leg two. And I'm sure Torben Grail, Matina Grail's dad, will be happy <laughs> sitting down there and 
and they're just going to go through. They're going through slowly, saving themselves a jibe, and they take the win. And oh, just have to keep the boat upright there for a moment. And they must be pretty happy about that. They've had a good day on the very, water. Very, very good day on the water. As next will through through come through the Germans. Yotsuk Yotsuk and Lawrence. A, a very, very good race for them. In, in fact, they're putting together probably the best regatta they've had for a while, Marcus. Yeah, I think they came so far. third at the Worlds two years ago, uh, but they'd be very happy um, just a few months before the Olympics to, to put in results like that. It's going to be very interesting to see how they'll do on the weekend. But they look very calm and collected. Very good. Impressive. I'd say to you, for me, a step up from what I saw three years ago when um, I was with you, that they've improved immensely. Tess Lloyd and Catlin Elks, they were leading for a while, but still a good finish for them. Third place for the Australians. Mm. And a tiring day, just a little bit of a slower drop there because they're not racing anymore. The crews will be pretty shattered at the end of those three races. Three physical races. And, and in context of the 49er racing, uh, you were talking earlier, these are relatively long races in terms of the sprint nature as uh, world number one come through. And uh, we've talked about, are they a little bit off the pace in this condition? I'm sure they're not over the course of the regatta, but they don't seem to be able, uh, they don't seem to be able to convert like the, the no, couple I of think, the other teams. I think they're just sailing smart. You know, they're sailing smart, they're starting well, but for the start that they had, they didn't get the finish they yep. deserved. Conti and Klepsic, uh, they started top mark. They were they were sixth, actually. They got through to fourth, so they picked a couple off. But um, in, in terms of where they sit in the world, probably they'll be a little bit disappointed in that. Another good finish for the Argentinians, just behind another Australian team of Olivia Price and Eliza Solly. And then the Finns crossing the line there. We've seen quite a lot of the Finns today, so that's, that's quite good scores by the uh, Finnish team today. We need to find out where the name Clear Water comes from. Uh, yes. Yeah, you, it's, I don't think it's the water. <laughs> <laughs> when I was coming in here, the, the cab drivers and they have a real problem here with sinkholes. Really? And, and people, yeah, that, and because it's a, whatever they the geography is of the land it, it can dragging out of fresh water mm. and the land collapses and it's that's a, scary it's, it's an issue that's, that's not scary you just scared me peter that's what we're, we're, we're on the it third, was be. third story of something that's about to disappear into now, the sea interesting there they, it's um alex maloney molly meach coming through uh, they were deep they had a bad start i'm um, just looking marcus can you bring up where they ended up in that ten. race ten. Ten. 10 so that'll be their drop but, uh, again, that high risk, high reward didn't pay off for them that time, Andy? No, that's right. You, you called it before the start. You were concerned that that was high risk up by the committee boat. But that was the so sort of start the Italians pulled off. And they managed to get away with it. And the Italians had a fantastic start. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's about knowing when to pull the trigger. It looked to me like they were a little bit higher, the committee boat. So maybe they got a little bit squeezed out. And maybe they had to wait for their turn. Would have there been anything in terms of, I'm, I'm talking coaching now and strategy, so they, they'd have known the points. So they're going into the race and they say, right, if we, we can take a risk because we can drop it. Oh, it's a bit, it's a it, bit early well, on in the regatta Yeah, for but that. it's the last race of qualifying, so you get a drop, your first drop. Or, or oh, do that's you, true, that's or true. Or do I you mean, say, let, let's, let's go for broke, let's take a risk, we, we might get a one, two or three. And if we, if we can't pull it off, it's our drop anyway. Uh, 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 do you think they're that savvy to do that? Well, that, that takes a lot of savvy to do that. Marcus, do you, th what, do you what think do you that's... Think, no, no, I, I think it makes, it makes perfect sense. That's the way they would have thought um, because they know that there, there is a discard. Their worst score so far was a seventh. So you go for more risk in that race. So I'm you sure. say, well, if we conserve it, if we could get six or seven, but actually if we go for broke and try and win the race... Yeah. But if you already got good scores from, from a different approach, why change that approach? Do you but it, do but you it was the same, same approach as the previous race, and it worked. Wasn't it? Start well, at the one true. So, so maybe they were as high risk on the previous race maybe. and it just worked I don't know. out. I just, I just, just Sometimes it's nuances that you can't really see from the outside. Is that Whether a coaching? someone takes more risk or less risk, it could be in a situation at the starting uh, vessel where you just go a little bit further to the right because you think you're going to get the, uh, the pole position squeezing in and then it doesn't work out and you think, well, okay, that was my discard. When I are you going to wire up their brains to the analytics? I mean, this is what we really need we're to working know on it. We're working on it all the time.
I mean, if we can actually start to influence what they're thinking as well. Well, that would be kind of Yeah, that would creepy. be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> so but we've just been talking about uh, strategy, and, and, and in some ways, this is the role of the coach, isn't it? You sit there with the, the sailors and say, right, you know, these are the points. This is what you've got. You've got one more race of qualifying to go, or two races. If you can win, great. If you, if you don't win, you're going to discard it anyway. To, yeah. Well, as, opposed, as opposed to at the beginning of the regatta, you say, no, no, low risk. We'll just tick them off. Yeah, I, think I the, don't know. I just the, the coach has to help them to keep their head level and, and uh, to solve problems. If they come back to the coach boat after a race, he needs to know, were they slow or were they stupid? And that's what he needs to tell him, you know, and then just keep their head level and do what they train to do. It's, it's, it can be very simple, but it requires a very good coach to do that job well. It's a poor choice, Marcus, but would you rather be slow or stupid? Oh, Jesus. In sailing? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> stupid and fast. <laughs> uh, okay, let's just have a little bit of a uh, recap here. We are at... In Florida, clear water for the 49er FX World Championships and the 49er World Champs. We've had three races this morning for the women in the uh, 49er FX. They are finished for the day. They'll go ashore now. But uh, stay with us because it's not all over. We've got 49er racing. The men, they're going to do four races. Um, they uh, It'll be action-packed. And in that fleet, it's been really the Kiwis of Peter Burling, Blair Took, who uh, they're on five bullets Andy, strategy for them for the day. Do they just keep rolling, or do you think they pull back on their accelerator? What what mindset do they have going into today? They are the target. Everyone's measuring themselves against them now. They'll be looking over their shoulder, looking at the Aussies, traditional rivalry, saying Outridge, Olympic gold medalists from London 2012. They haven't raced against the Aussies yet because they're on different sides of the draw. So I think they will be looking to get as much money in the bank as they can in qualifying. If they can get a run of bullets, if they can win all their races in qualifying, that's what they'll do. Okay, so you're saying they'll just business as usual. Let's give it a rip. Just keep on doing what we do. I mean, this this is the biggest regatta before the Olympics. It's another six months before the Olympics. This is the best time for them to put all their cards on the table and, and to test themselves and to say, what are we capable of? And um, they have a choice of boats. I understand for, from a conversation we were having last night that maybe they've got five 49ers in the family at the Amazing. moment. <laughs> um, but they like this one, right? They, so they like this one. I think this is the boat they used, I understand, in Argentina. Brand, it was brand new then. They've got another one in New Zealand that they'll make a choice between this boat and, and a, a new one that they have in the bag. Well, I, I think the, the, the bet to have between us is when are they going to lose a race? You know, that, that's A regatta or a race? A race. I mean, they, they, they haven't lost a race yet this week, I Peter. Know, I know. I, I mean, it, in terms of sailing, we think of great sailors in the world. We think of Paul Elstrom. We think of Buddy Melges. Um, you know, Rodney Patterson. Do you think at such a young age, Ben Ainsley, of course, and, and Robert Scheidt. Are we, are we looking at this combination... Torben Grau, because he's listening. Tor- yeah, hi, Torben, and, and of course. Uh, are we looking at in the same... Are they in that very, very special group yet, or are they too young? I think they're well on their way. I mean, you've, you've got to get more medals on the... Olympic medals is the measure, isn't it? They've got a silver medal already, um, but they need, they need to get that gold medal at Rio 2016 before we can start thinking about them in those terms. So that's pressure. It is, but they don't seem to feel it. Doesn't doesn't seem to. It, it's interesting, and, and every now and again in the world of yachting, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to, to watch the Finn Gold Cup down in Auckland, and Giles Scott, to me, was sensational. I, I was in awe how good he was, and he won the Finn Gold Cup, which is, you know, arguably the most physical yachting discipline. Day to spare. Or yeah, he does metal. it in his sleep. I and mean, and you, you just go... Well, how does this happen? And, and I look at the Olympic classes, and there's a number of them that um, there's a number of them that this is happening at the moment. That people are very dominant, and we, we've got one of those crews here at the moment. Yeah, we're about to see it. We're about to witness that in hopefully a few minutes' time. Well, it's uh, certainly been beautiful here in Florida. The conditions ideal. Uh, early in the week, it wasn't ideal. Um, the 49er class we're getting ready for, um, the, uh, they'll do four races. It is their last, also their last day of qualifying. Of course, the fleet we will cover 
there's only one of two fleets. And then after today's racing, we'll go to the Gold Fleet Racing, which we'll be covering tomorrow and, and on Sunday. Absolutely. When we see the best of the best. Which is fascinating. We are just filling at the moment. We're waiting to get reorganised. The race committee, you can see, are, are on station. And, and I think we've got preliminary results that we could look at. Uh, the results just came in from the other race course. That's interesting, of course. Um, let's uh, go through them quickly. Meloni and Meech, as we said, uh, they, they won the qualification. Jurtuk and Lawrence in second place. They'll be very happy with that result, I'm sure. Graylin Kunze in third place. Echegayan Betansos uh, from Spain in fourth. Uh, Great Britain fifth. Uh, Netherlands sixth. Uh, Italy seventh. Denmark 8th, and Henken and Schutt uh, from the United States uh, in ninth place. Now, what's interesting for me there, what's interesting for me there, what's interesting for me there, Marcus, is um, we look at, you know, one to nine, there's there's not one country that's doubled up. And, and uh, normally we've looked at these regattas and there's been, you know, two from... GBR or two from Germany, and and uh, for me that's a strength of the class. Absolutely, we're, we're seeing here top nine, nine countries. Yeah, absolutely. that's got to be a positive, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it uh, it's surprising because the Danes have been so dominant and uh, they're just in eighth position right now. Maybe selection? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> maybe selection pressure. I don't know. We will we'll find out. Yeah, uh, that whole selection debate is is very interesting. Oh, yeah, uh, you can spend I hours on that. I know down under we've changed to a different system. You're staying with a, a point system we don't. Ours is selection. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure at the back end of this regatta, there will be Australians and New Zealanders selected by selectors. Yep. And, uh, and we moved away from what you guys have got because it's, it's tough. That's yeah, I think tough. a lot of nations have issues with s someone taking the responsibility at making that decision they're all shying away from it but um, i think very often it, it's it's just blatantly obvious that uh, on points it's the wrong person going to the it, it can be to the re not it always can be. it can be yeah. you you, yeah. you run a risk it's a bit like a high risk start isn't it yeah <laughs> anyway the points uh, we've got a long way to go yet when we see the 49er fx tomorrow uh, of course this group of sailors, up to 25, the boys were saying. We've got uh, Ericsson and Klinger from um, Sweden. They're coming in at 10th at the moment. Okay, so we take a little break um, until the 49ers got their course sorted out, and we'll be back as soon as possible.
Welcome back to Clearwater and here in Florida for day four of the 49er, 49er FX World Championships. We've had some racing this morning. The FX are finished. They did three races, and now we're setting up for the 49er Open Division. And it's been uh, certainly an interesting week. With the, the talking point has been the New Zealand crew of Peter Burling and Blair Took. They've won five races on the trot. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm Peter Leston. I'm joined in commentary booth here in Clearwater with Andy Rice. Good afternoon, Andrew. And Marcus Bauer, who uh, really drives the sail track uh, animation for us. Now, Andy, come to you. We've still got quite a long way in qualifying. Why are we still in qualifying? I thought we were doing Gold Fleet today. Was it the conditions on day one, day two? Yes, it was, yeah. Um, we got just... 1.45 to go to the start, and we're looking at really lovely conditions at, on a typical uh, sunny winter day in Florida. It's been nothing like this earlier in the week. It was freezing cold. I was wearing my woolly hat. The sailors have been shivering as they've come ashore. There have been multiple mast breakages because the waves have been big, the wind has been strong, and that has held up the schedule. So we are behind schedule. We've had an extra day of qualifying today, which is what we're about to get into now. And we got 1 minute 20 to the start. And looking at the previous races, Peter, it was pretty obvious which side you wanted to go. And that won't be lost on these sailors either. They want to go left. They want to come in towards the shore, go in towards the beach as close as they dare before they run aground because the wind is better on the left-hand side of this course. What has happened? There's the race, uh, the regatta leaders, the New Zealanders. Peter Burling, Blair Took, have not been beaten in an international race since 2012. They got second at the Olympics and they dominate. Now, Andy, we're coming up here to the business end. One thing that has happened from the FX, the whole course has been moved further north down the beach. So now we do have the this obstruction of the jetty. You call us into the start. What what um, what influence is that uh, obstruction of the, the well, pier going to have? Well, we're about to find out find out because 20 seconds to go and the boats will launch fairly soon let's hope it's a clear start and that no one is over early but these boats down this end of the line which include Pete Burling and Blair Chuk must be absolutely sure that when they come off this line they will be able to avoid the pier there's a long wooden pier that sticks far out into the sea from the beach and they will need to make sure that they can get round that pier so th this is the nature of this kind of setting they're just about to get going now who's going to get a good start Great start for the Italians down at the pin end. Pretty good for the Kiwis as well. It seems they've got enough clear air to be able to do what they want to do. But are they aiming towards this pair or are they going to clear it? We will find out shortly. So first race of the day, day four of 49er class. We're in, uh, this is race six of the regatta, the Lured end. It was Italy and New Zealand pushed hard for the Lured end. As uh, we see, we're on leg one coming up. And the Italians look like uh, they're almost affecting the flow over the New Zealanders there, Andy? I don't know. I mean, they, I think the Kiwis are a little bit higher. They may not be faster, but I think they've got enough height there. They can come out from um, over the top of Stefano Cherin and Andrea Tesse. The Italians are not one of the stronger teams here. They've got a great start here, but I think that Berling and Chuk will fancy that they will be able to get over the top of the Italians fairly soon. So on board with, uh, that's Peter Berling on the helm, Blair Tuke uh, in the forward hand. Wonderful combination, and uh, they have absolutely been hammering this regatta. They have not been beaten so far after five races in a, in a, a race. Uh, they started down towards that lured end. And if they can roll over the top of the, Italian, uh, the uh, Italians down to Lourdes, that'll be the key. Right now, the Italians have still got a long way to go towards uh, the beach. There's still plenty of water. But uh, like you said, Andy, it looks like the New Zealanders have managed to gauge away a little bit, a little bit more separation. Yeah, although the Italians are holding their own very well, and they're not world-class Italians, but it just goes to show how powerful getting the pin end of the start is because you can just sail your boat how you want to. You can just put the bow down if you need to and just free up the sails a little bit. The Kiwis don't have that luxury, but what the Kiwis do have is the pedigree to be able to hang in there in difficult places, and this is looking very, very good indeed for New Zealand at the moment. They've missed that pier that I was talking about. It never came into view, so they, they've cleared the wooden pier quite easily. But the people, the spectators out on the end of that pier are getting an absolute grandstand view. 
free of charge, watching the best sailors in the world sailing along Clearwater Beach right now. OK, here's the first tack. So New Zealand tacked away. They must have felt... Uh, they were being influenced, but can the New Zealanders get round the bow of the next boat? Oh, it's Ooh, close. I think there that, was a dip there. That was, I think there was a course change there by the Nick. Is that an Irish? I think I'm seeing an Irish. Uh, I think it flag. is an Irish boat. Yes, and I will. agree with you. I'm I th- surprised they keep going. I thought um, there had to. That was a port starboard. I think so. I mean, I, I think that uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't clear them. I think the, the Irish had to bear away to avoid a collision. Now, will the Irish have shouted protest or will they give the world champions a free pass there? Well, we'll wait and see. The might well they certainly would say for race number six, it could be provisional if um, after the race there might be some protest action on uh, keep that one in the back of your mind from Ireland 99. I'm surprised that the Kiwis tacked when they did anyway because there was more ley line here. The Irish had gone all the way out to this ley line. And uh, as we've seen earlier on in the FX races, the power of the left is so strong on this course. Now, Marcus, um, what are you seeing on the animation? It it, uh, certainly looked uh, pretty lured in start, bottom third. The Italians certainly in the lead. They look pretty solid. And that cross, how did you read the cross? Uh, well, I'd have to play back right now. I don't want to do that uh, as the race goes on. But it, you mean the cross that Burling? Yeah, t- Paul yeah, Starbuck. Were well, you watching that it, one? It, it did look like there was a bear away. So I'll, after the race, I'll look at it. We'll, and we'll have a look. Detail. We'll come back to that one. It will be. Uh, it could be a talking point. So Andy, now it's sort of settled down. It's it's interesting, isn't it? There's been a bit of a strategy change, and I get the impression, just looking at out the window, that in fact the breeze has gone to the right. You could well be right. The, gen- the general flow. It looks like uh, the boats that I'm looking at here look like they're headed on more on um, more on port than the, the previous races. It could well be. So maybe there has been a shift to the right. I would say that it's no more than 10 degrees, though. I think we're more or less looking at the same course geometry as we were earlier for the okay. FXs. Okay. Um, but uh, if, if there has been a slight shift to the right, does that mean that the left won't be as powerful as it was? It well, I think what's happened is the whole course has been changed because I'm. I, I, when we but it's were a doing, longer course. It's a longer course, but also the top mark is further out to sea or further off the coast than what it was earlier, and, and, and they've moved north up the beach. So we've got a slightly s- a different course configuration. It still looks very good for the boats on the left-hand side in terms of they, they look lifted, they look powerful, and how will Pete Burling and Blair Chute come back from that side? They're still quite far left, but the Italians are further over to the left. So if the Italians manage to match the Kiwis, uh, a, a world-class team against a, a sort of a middle-of-the-fleet team, if the Italians manage to hold on to the Kiwis at the top mark, it still tells us that, that the left is powerful. And, that, and that's a, a tick for them. they they got a a, a beautiful start down to leeward of the New Zealanders. They held them off all the way, forced them to take away, you'd have to say. Well, it looks like it. I think the Kiwis could have carried on longer than they did. I was surprised they tacked where they did. And, as we said just now, did they force the Irish to change course to avoid a collision? Well, it's uh, Seaton and McGovern, the Irish pair. What can you tell me about... Um, what can you tell me about the... the uh, you, you're, you just know all these people so intimately, the, the Italian pair that are in the league. Oh, you've, you're testing me on that are one. You, because, yeah, because, I mean, they're, they're really not the kind of that, team new, that we expect to be up here. New, new boys on the block. Well, they're doing very well, Chirin, to be up there pushing hard up the first one would be a long way to go yet. But they got a beautiful start. So Italy 96 as we head up towards the top mark, all the, the majority of the fleet now, all the fleet, in fact, are heading out on port. But right now, there's only been two tacks uh, up the first beat. There hasn't been a lot of tacks. Marcus was talking about earlier, I asked the question, how expensive tacks were, and you said they're pretty expensive. You know, yeah, I'd, three, I'd, three lengths, that's a lot. At least three lengths. I, I'd say it depends on the conditions, of course, but if it's wavy, then the boats really stop. You can't carry any so momentum m- through the tack. Minimizing taxes is, is a is Oh, in conditions like today, strategy. for sure. For yeah, it's sure. lumpy and not extra windy. So This is a speed race. It's right, the, the it's conditions a drag race. Are very, very steady conditions. You need to start well and be fast. So here we go. Here's the regatta leaders so far. Uh, Peter Burling, Blair Tuke. They have now tacked back onto starboard. Andy, are they close to the ley line? Have have you got your head around that out there? 
I think they Coming are. Coming up I towards this the first their, black. I'm pretty sure this will be their final approach to the top mark, first time round. And then we will find out how they're doing against those Italians. They but, just well, uh, squeezed in there, Gilmore and Brake. That's right. It's David Gilmore from Western Australia. Had a shocking day yesterday. He'll be a lot happier to be up there. Left. He came out of the lead. He came out of the lead. <laughs> he, he wasn't great off the start, and he's uh, got into the lead. And those and Italians, they also came in from the left. They were leading earlier on, and they are just holding back the world champions in the left of our picture, the one on the sale of Peter Burling and Blair Chuk. So we have David Gilmore from Australia in the lead. We've got Italy second. We've got the New Zealanders third. Halfway up the beat, we were calling Italy, New Zealand, and then, as we experienced earlier in the day, the left was strong on the top of the course, and it was David Gilmore who took full advantage of that to leap into the lead. He will be pleased. I, 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 spoke, I spoke to David yesterday on the on the dock after racing, and they were bitterly disappointed with their day yesterday. Oh, and, he was uh, in a dark mood, wasn't he? He was filthy, and but uh, <laughs> he'll be pretty happy now. And, it's well, can he hold on? I mean, he'll he'll be happy if he holds on to this win, but he's got those world champions breathing down his neck, Pete Burling and Blair Chuk, who have yet to drop a race. Is this going to be the first race they lose? Well, I don't think so. I mean, they've only got two to overtake. We're well, talking about third place here, and you're talking <laughs> about a drop. <laughs> well, yeah. This is the measure yeah. of these guys. Anything less than a win at the moment seems to be a disappointment. Yeah, you want to go on board with them and find out what the hell they're doing. What, what are they doing differently, you know? It, it doesn't look that spectacularly different. Well, Marcus, you have uh, two Olympics in the, this class. You know, must what's going on? Why are they so good? I think it's their manoeuvres and, the, and their crew work. Well, their crew work under pressure is impeccable. So, but the others invest so much time in their boat work and their, and their boat handling, so it, it surprises me if that's the difference. It seems like they have a slight speed edge in, in sticky spots. They, they squeeze out of sticky spots a b little bit more easily, and then they don't, do any, they don't make any strategic and tactical mistakes. But they're in third now. Let's see if they can catch up. Beautiful drive there, uh, just watching them sprint behind one behind the other. Staying at the back of the boat, that was really nice to see that bit of onboard footage there. Here you can see how the speed goes down in the jibe, almost half the speed in the jibe and re-accelerating now. Boat's doing 13 knots and probably something like, what do you think, t uh, 11 knots of, of wi wind? So uh, yeah, I would say that's about right. So sailing slightly faster than wind speed. Well, it's typical uh, apparent wind sailing, isn't it? You get going, wind comes forward, you generate more apparent wind speed. More acceleration. <laughs> it's, uh, and, and it, it all builds on itself. And uh, you asked me about Stefano Cirin and Andrea Tese. I just did a little bit of work on the internet. Their world championship positions at the previous Worlds were 30th last year in Argentina, 12th the year before in Santander, and 37th the year before that in Marseille. So the 12th... 12th is pretty good. Yeah, it gives sh some shine of... Sorry some sign of potential but uh, they they are not sort of uh, typical top 10 material so they're having a really good race well good there. for them they they certainly uh, managed that pre-start pretty well they did uh, at the top mark i guess they got a bit locked in with burling and Took, and that opened the door for gilmore and uh, break to get in there and it is david gilmore leading well the animation is actually saying not that but it certainly will just wait as they come into that bottom mark gate well, yeah, it's, it's a matter of did the Italians who carried on a little bit further in towards the shore, is that the way to go? Or was it uh, Gilmore who jived a little bit earlier? It looks to me like Gilmore on the right has got the better of the Italians. They're, they're really close together. So that, that was right. There was changing positions, but it, now they can cross. Gilmore can cross. Yeah, to me, Gilmore's got the bottom mark gate He's, uh, as we come back to the live shots. And it is David Gilmore in the lead. Going around that favoured left-hand mark, taking him out to the favoured left-hand side of this course. Yeah, get, and where is Burling and Chuk? Uh, I think they're back in third. It's that second blue spinnaker. It does look like, sorry to interrupt, but it does look like this is not the favourite mark. It's the favoured side of the course, but the other mark is favoured, and the other boats are going around it's, it. And so that other boat is none other than the reigning world champion, so they fancy going around the out-to-sea mark, 
and the benefit for them is once they get out of that traffic, they'll be able to attack. But oh, they're attacking already. Look how soon they're attacking. So they've taken the bias that you talked about, Marcus, but a, a real quick downspeed tack into traffic. Uh, I'm surprised they attacked so early. I think going early another on. 15, 20 metres would have would have paid off a lot. I was I thought it was really interesting that they went around that mark because with a clean manoeuvre, that was the favourite side. Probably the advantage on that gate mark over there is uh, 10, 15 metres. If so, that was anybody else, I would have said, what a silly place to tack. But it's the, it's the world champions. So um, why did the world champions tack so soon after going around that mark? Your boat handling needs to be well, excellent to get away with it. I think one of the possible answers to that is that they, they wanted to take the advantage of the, the bias of the gate, but they want to go left. And so therefore it's that, that risk reward. If we, if we keep going out to sea right, uh, you know, giving away valuable meters, we know we're going to pay, we're going to pay dearly but against the teams that are going hard left into the beach. But I, I, I agree with you if, you, if you're sailing optimists when distance is so important, but that's two extra maneuvers in a fast boat. Maneuvers are slow in a 49er. They did an extra jive and an extra tack to do what they've done now. So in terms of Marcus's numbers, you're saying two, two tacks, that's six lengths. Well, no, two, one tack extra. One tack, so it's three lengths. Yeah, and a jive. And, and an extra jive. So maybe a boat length there. So, so uh, you know, the four boat lengths given away for probably only, what, two or three boat lengths of, of uh, advantage in terms of the way the marks were positioned. So it's a net loss. Well, yeah, but the other gain is that they at least have a clear lane. You know, they're not following the, the two leading boats out. So um, um, uh, they at least have the opportunity to put the bow where they want to put the, put the boat where they want to put the boat. So we go back to the uh, race leader, David Gilmore. They came in. They got a good start. They won the left at the, right at the top mark, and they snuck in around the bow of the Italians and the New Zealanders. And like we saw early in the, the day, the leading boat tends to jump away, and certainly David Gilmore is uh, in a very commanding position at the moment. I get the impression also the wind is down a little bit, do you think, compared with earlier? Yeah, I think so. I think it was starting to drop away a little bit in the last race of the FXs. I think we saw the strongest wind earlier on in the day. Um, so that they're still, still fully stretched, but they're on full power conditions, probably looking for every bit of power they can find in the rig at the moment. And the Kiwis, they have tack, you know, they're, they're on the same tack as everybody else. Everyone is going out to the left towards the beach. But I'm just still wondering whether those extra two manoeuvres did them any favours at all. Well, in the context of, of where they're at, uh, you, you know, the race so far, they've had a, a, a possible port starboard incident. They, we're, you know, we, we benchmark them on their manoeuvres and bottom mark gates, top mark roundings as we look at Burling and Took. And, and in terms of their high standards, maybe not such a great race for them in terms of uh, the way this one's panned out so far. No, it was an error of judgment with the Irish, and we'll see if they get away with that or whether they end up in the protest room tonight. And, uh, well, my, who knows uh, if the, what the Irish will decide to do with that. But, uh, yeah, two, two extra manoeuvres to be where they are now. And has it done, has it worked out for them? They're crossing behind the other two boats. I don't think they've made any gains. I think they've lost a little bit on the two leading boats. So I'd say overall it was a net loss to do what they've done. This is the first race of day four. 49er world champs here in Clearwater. It's race six of the regatta. It's the last day of qualifying. We're going to have four races to complete the qualifying. And then tomorrow we're into Gold Fleet. And then on Sunday... And then the, the final hurrah, Sunday afternoon, the medal race. Can't wait. That's right. Now, will, there, will the medal race decide the gold medal, or will Pete Burling and Blair Chuk have run away with it already? Andy, Just... I think you're way ahead of yourself. <laughs> As well, David Gilmore. Now, David Gilmore, again, yachting families. Peter Gilmore and Christina down in Perth, Western Australia. Peter Gilmore being who? Peter Gilmore, legend match racer, world champion, America's Cup sailor. One of the good guys of our sport. And uh, they've got three sons, all yachties. Young Lockie, Sam, and uh, David. And they were, I can remember them in Auckland as little, just little kids uh, in the America's Cup. They'd race around and look at them now. He's out there winning a, a world championship race in Clearwater. And it, it's he... interesting in how many of um, siblings 
names. We, we were talking about Martina Grail earlier, and, and in this one we're talking about David Gilmour. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's great when uh, you see generations following through after previous generations. It, it is a very addictive sport, and it, it's great to see parents bringing their kids into it. Here's the overview. Gilmour leading, Italians following him, Berling and Tuke in third place. So, safe third place, I'd say. And, and, you know, if it wasn't their amazing record, third is very much still a keeper, uh, Marcus, in terms of when you're looking at regatta scores. Yeah, but I thought, you know, the big topic going into this regatta was that can they hold that superior position? And uh, so far we've been talking about winning regattas, but now they're winning every race. I mean, we're, we're, but I think that's un unbelievable. I mean, that's probably unrealistic for that to keep happening because that's what I'm, I thought before I'm sure the way they will construct their their regatta you know in conjunction with Hamish Wilcox their their um their coach is is what's happened is is in terms of after five races a bit of a bonus as we look at coming up to the top mark for the second time it is Gilmore and Brake leading Turin and Tessie from Italy after getting a beautiful start there's in third place, the New Zealanders, Peter Burling, Blair Tuke. They got the gold bibs on, which uh, indicate that going into today's racing, they were in the lead overall. Tell us about the number. Number one, that's not their personal number. No, it's uh, for the top ten in the previous World Championship, they get allocated their finishing position from the previous world. So that number one tells us that in uh, the end of last year, the previous worlds in Argentina, it was Pete Belling and Blair Chuk that won those worlds, and that's why they carry the number one on their sail. But they've been carrying that number one on their sail for the last three years. They've won the last three World Championships. Now, that's Jonas Warra, the 2008 Olympic gold medalist. He was a bit of a surprise Olympic champion then in quite controversial circumstances. But uh, he won his first race of the week and uh, also sailing extremely well this week. But uh, probably an outside bet for a medal, not one of the favourites for, for a medal, even though he's won that gold eight years ago. So we're looking here at... Uh, regatta leader so far as they come into the top mark. Blair Tuke just making some adjustments. Marcus, talk us into the, the bearaway set. Yeah, they're just speeding up right after the bearaway uh, and heading out to the uh, left-hand side of the course, uh, obviously. I think the pattern is clear. There's just a little bit more breeze on the left-hand side, and that's where everybody's going, and that turns it in a bit of a drag, into a bit of a drag race. Um, not much catching up he can do, really. Um, let's let's just follow that gap. At the moment, uh, they're at 250 meters behind the leader, uh, and roughly 100 meters behind uh, the Italians. Um, so let's follow up on the gap. So it seems uh, that, that uh, th this today's racing is going to be dominated, as often is the case in our sport, Andy. Start first cross. Yeah. Top mark. Well, look, look at the Italians. They won the pin end of the line. That's one of the best places you can start in a 49er race, and they're still in second. And uh, they, they've held off Berling and Chuk. I think Berling and Chuk have made a couple of tactical errors during the race. They should have probably been able to have overtaken the Italians by now. But uh, the Italians got that start, and they've held their nerve. I think it could change on the last day, though, with the offshore breeze. We will see more confusing, uh, more demanding, strategically and tactically demanding conditions, and it uh, could be a totally different picture. So the outlook right now, this is, I assume it's a southerly or southwest breeze. So for the last day, uh, uh, the forecast, the long forecast is for the breeze to come around and, and come from the, the west. East. I think it's east, the east. east from so the it'll, east. Be, it'll be blowing off the beach. Off, off the offshore beach. So breeze, it's yeah. Okay, offshore breeze. So that will uh, quieten down the, the sea state. It'll also really swirl up the wind because we've got some really tall hotels around here. Right. And that's going to have an effect. I'm keeping an eye on the gap, by the way, and it is narrowing. So uh, they are closing in a little bit. Still 100 metres, though, isn't it? Still uh, plenty. It's, it's, it's plenty. We're lucky that Marcus is here. He drives the sail tracks for us. Lovely animations. The SAP sailing analytics, that is. That's really giving us all the good inside information. And it's, it's, it's great. It certainly makes the role a lot, lot easier if you can analyze and dig in. Actually, I, I love the way you can actually do analytics with your package. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the 
main thing was that we wanted to have live leaderboards so we actually know what the score is and after the race we can go in and look at uh, the overall scores uh, that wasn't possible before and uh, now we can also look at speeds and distances and and uh, the gap for example which no it hasn't really changed actually yeah. on the on this downwind it's uh, 195 meters to the leader from Berling and Tuke uh, so it is a drag race at the moment as the Italians come into the bottom mark, Gilmore already around the bottom mark gate, heading up wind now for the final time. Good lead, solid lead, 30 metres. And, and one-way track, as long as you've got the many, pace, yeah. you're, you're, you're feeling safe. Not many decisions for Gilmore to make here, really. It's it's all playing into the hands of the leader. But, uh, yes, behind, we see Burling and Chute going out to sea again. They really fancy themselves out on the, the seaside of that course, which nobody else seems to be going for up amongst the front pack. How long before we see them tack? Surely they're not going to... Maybe they're thinking third is, is going to be our discard. We might as well gamble and see if we can get back to first. I, I, well, we talked about that <laughs> earlier, but I think it's a bit early. They've got four races today, to be honest. <laughs> but I think, it, I think it was a good move again. They, they just hate to do extra distance, and that uh, mark was just a closer mark. And I'm surprised they go that far now, but I think they... They learned on the last up when you don't want to tack too early and they're avoiding a couple of boats uh, that are coming in from, from the downwind. They want to take the advantage to sail over them as opposed to under them like Gilmore and, and Brake do here. And then I think they're going to tack early and, and um, speed over to the other side quickly. They have tacked now. It's always a trade-off though, Marcus, isn't it? If you, you know, you, here they go. You, you take the advantage and they're now back on starboard. You take the advantage of the bottom mark gate but then it forces you the wrong way. How long do you take that medicine before you come back to the favoured side? I think they move into second position in a in a in a second. Yeah, I you think, be surprised. You think they've got a piece of uh, the, the Italians. Italians? I think they're close. Okay, well, if they get close, they will certainly uh, put them under pressure. It hasn't been the tidiest race from the regatta leaders as we look, and, and in fact, the animation is showing a, a big change that. Oh, the Danes are coming in. I think that's an error. Okay, well, we're not, we're not dead sure we're getting the right data, but what we can say, Andy, oh, is... actually, sorry, sorry. I, the, the data is correct, the possibly. Data is correct. The Danes have moved onto the right-hand side of the course okay, as well, okay. and they, they're taking... It, it, seems to be, it seems to be good over there. Well, well, we'll just watch as they come up to the cross, but let's go back and have a look. Who have we got? Pete, uh, not Peter Gilmore, David Gilmore in the lead as he tacks. And then over there on the right-hand side with the New Zealand and the Danish flag, they are now showing uh, second and third. What's Andy, this is the first time today that we've seen, if, if Sharon has fallen back, it's the first time that the left hasn't paid. Well, Marcus mentioned earlier about um, the, the, one of the benefits of what the Kiwis have done is they've sailed over the top of all the traffic still coming down when the Italians might have suffered from a bit of bad air from the boats still coming downwind. But I still fancy the Italians to um, yeah, eyeballing beat, it. To, to beat the Kiwis on the next cross. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We uh, certainly go off what we've got on screen, but we're lucky enough here that we can have a bit of a look out the window. And just eyeballing it, we'll wait for the cross to develop. But I they, think, they look high, don't they, on I the left-hand side? The I boats think, that are on Port Tack look high. I think the Italians are still ahead of New Zealand. Of Burling and Took. David Gilmore's gone. He's solidly in the lead. And that, that, that lead change for him at the top mark was, um, was good. What we will say, I think the Italians are in the lead, but Burling and Took are, are closer. And, and it was a smart move by them. I mean, it was a brave move, but I think they looked behind them and thought, we've got a bit of money in the bank on the boats behind. We might as well try an attacking move on the front too, because we're not going to beat them by going the same way as them. So and, I think and it was a bit of a gamble. It wasn't necessarily probably their favoured option, but it was the best chance they had of attacking. And, and now they probably get the benefit because what it means is they are on the left on that final approach to the top mark. They've now tacked, we're talking about Burling and two, to windward, uh, slightly to windward of the, the race leader, Gilmore and Brake, but to quite a bit to windward of Sharon and Tessie. 
So they might get the benefit of that left-hand favour a bit more than the Italians. Yeah, a bit more angle. I'm again looking at it um, out out on the water. It it looks like Burling and Took have got slightly more pressure. Certainly a little bit better angle. Are you getting uh, Marcus off the animation? Can you tell me, uh, you know, in terms of heading, are the the boats on the left a little bit higher than the boats on the right? The bearing is actually 238 degrees on, on uh, Burling and Tuke, and the Italians are going 245. Yeah, so you're so right. You can actually, I can see from the tails that there's a now I, quite I, a bit I, of a difference. I cheated, mate. I looked out the window, but I, I just think, again, that That's isn't, cheating. isn't that the power of the animation? Isn't that so cool that we can dial it up? Yep, it, it, it looks like there's a bit in the left. and you Yeah, you can actually be sure of what's ten, going on. She's 10 degrees. And, and the Italians are going low right now. So that will make it interesting, Andy, uh, it, towards the top mark. It, um, this might be the moment for the Kiwis to pounce, and are the Italians up to the pressure of being challenged by the world champions for second place? But it's all good for the Australians. US, uh, AUS 91, it's David Gilmore. He had a shocking day yesterday. He was a bit grumpy in the park when I was talking to him, but he'd be delighted. Got a good start won the left because Burling and Tuke and the Italians really got into a little bit of a tussle on the right, opened up that opportunity, lead change at the top mark. Hasn't put a foot, foot wrong since. No, I mean, it, it has been an easy race to lead, but still full credit to him. He, he got the right move at the start, really good start. This is probably their final tack of this race and just a couple of manoeuvres, a couple of jibes down the run and they will win this race. They're the training partners of Nathan Outridge and Ian Jensen the reigning Olympic champions. It's the reigning Olympic champions going to the Games again in Rio 2016. So these guys know they're not going to the Games, but they have the benefit of training with Nathan Outridge and Ian Jensen. You know, what's interesting, isn't uh, Nathan Outridge good at tuning up young guys? Because, of course, before the last Olympics, he trained up and, and trained Peter Burling. I don't think that happens anymore. And, no. and now he's uh, doing the same with our race leader, uh, David Gilmore. And we just saw out of picture, we saw the yellow jerseys there. There they are, Pete Burling and Blair Chuk. Have they got the better of the Italians? We will find out shortly. Pretty well bowed about as they come into the top mark. Coming in from the right. It it's is really close. Starboard rights for the Italians. New Zealand will be required to keep clear. And they did. And so at the top mark, it is... Burling and Took still in third, but a lot, lot closer. I think we're in for an interesting downwind leap. They are not going to give up this place lightly. If they can take another place off the Italians, they will surely do so. It could be an interesting battle on that last downwind. It is awfully close, and we, we talked about him closing in, and he did. So, they did. So, Marcus, just talk about, so we can project ahead, passing opportunity. Is it at the point of jibe? When they get to that ley line... When they go into the jibe, could it come down to... What, what they will try now is to go a little bit deeper than the Italians and then, yes, jibe on top of them as, they, uh, as the Italians jibe and then roll them. I think that that'll be their goal. At the moment, they're not going lower than the Italians. Maybe they're going a little bit faster, closing the gap and then going lower late. So out in the lead, it is Gilmore and Brake. Uh, they have led really from the first mark and it has been a little bit of a one-way track but put that one down to a very very good start and good strategy up the first league and they have got a lot of work on today peter because it's about the qualifiers it's about making the final 25 well where are they are they at the moment before this race is counted 49th overall they've got a lot of climbing to do this will help them no end but Big they time. need to keep on doing this for the three races afterwards a absolutely so we look, it's, we're back to the lovely drone shot uh, with Gilmore and Brake on the ley line to the, down to the bottom mark gate towards the finish. They've, they've still got one and in when I uh, have a, a bit of a look. But one and in means what? Well, one jibe and in, one, one more jibe to complete as they head down. And here we can see that Burling and Hugh didn't manage to go lower than the Italians. Uh, actually, when they jibe now, there's no danger for, for uh, the Italians. Uh, that Burling and Hugh are not going to roll them, at least not easily. Well, that's good defense by the Italians because um, I'm sure the 
New Zealanders would love to get another point back, but uh, they're going to run out of racetrack unless they can uh, really pull something special. Synchronised driving there between the Italians and the Kiwis. Absolutely to the second. They both jived at the same time, and the jibes were equally good. So A nice shot from Burling and Tukes. Boom, by the way. Uh, you can see the Italians uh, in front there. And we could see now, if they have an advantage, if Burling and Tuke have an advantage, we would see that boat moving to the right-hand side, uh, the Italian boat in the background. So there will be a, a, a bearing change. The Certainly, as we look, uh, is it changing a little bit? Not, not sure. I think the Italians have done a superb job of really controlling the downwind. Totally up to the pressure of the world champions breathing down their necks, and it looks like the Italians are going to get second place. We see that Gilmore and Brake do win that race, which is going to pull them up the rankings no end. It's going to it's going to really help them out in their bid to get into the gold fleet. As we look for second and third to come, so Gilmore and Brake have already crossed the line. Next will be the Italian. Shirin and Tessie, and then Burling and Took. They probably had a little bit of a race that um, they'll be... I'm sure they'll talk about it. They... I didn't see... Sort it. of... I thought they were strong enough off the start to hang in there, but they didn't. They tacked away. There was a possible port starboard. So what, not one of their great races. No, I think that was their first mistake, was tacking away when they didn't need to. And then they, well, maybe the Irish called them across and said, yeah, carry on, mate, we'll let you go. Um, I don't really know why the Irish would have done that. I mean, the Irish having a good race as well. So so fourth over is a boat in from um, Spain. Thomas Warra is fifth, and Plazi is over there next. So looking, looking at the overall results, Cherian and Tessie having a 20th, a 17th, a 17th, a 24th, an 18th, and now a second. It might as well have been the race of their life. Well, read out the results for Gilmore. It's, it's not going to be a very different story for David Gilmore, I wouldn't think. He's had a pretty shocking regatta yesterday anyway. Yes, he was not happy, but he'll be absolutely delighted tonight um, or this afternoon with, uh, with that result. So Similar pattern. A fifth, a twentieth, a twenty-seventh, twenty-sixth, twenty-third, and now a first. So still only forty-fourth overall, and he's got to make that cut to, of the top twenty-fifth, uh, top twenty-five by the end of the day. So he's going to need to win some more races to do that, maybe. As now there's the Hedstrom coming through from Sweden. The Swedes are putting a big effort into forty-nine er sailing. Uh, yes, I, we, I, we were talking to one of their coaches yesterday, Paul Brotherton. Yep. F fell off one of your mountains recently in New Zealand. He's lucky to be alive. Yeah, bad mountain had, biking accident. He, he fell off his bike uh, down in Rotorua on a, on, a, um, on a track and literally nearly snapped his shoulder off. And luckily he, he, pumped, he punctured a lung, but they took him into hospital and he looked as good as new. But he's a wiry, tough little guy. Yeah, well, he's been to the Olympics uh, for Great Britain in the 470, one of our best 49er sailors of uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and now coaching the Swedes, which uh, it will be partly Paul Brotherton's input that is helping to contribute to the Swedes' improvement in the skiff classes. As we have more boats coming over the line with um, Italians coming through, a little bit spread out. There's one of the American boats now. Isn't that the nature of a one-track kind of course? It is. One-track pony. I mean, the rich get richer. And I think that's what we saw in the FX racing, and we saw certainly in that. If you get in a, a, pos a position of strength. But it sets us up nicely for the next one, doesn't it, in terms of we've had a little appetizer. What are we going to do now, pre-race strategy? Do we start down towards Panin, bottom third? And, and really, you've got to own the left-hand side and be pretty close to that port ley line as you do that um, top mark approach. Because if you're not, you run the risk of getting rolled like uh, David Gilmore got in there. He, he managed to go a little bit further to the left, open the door, and then shut it at the top mark. Um, if Marcus has any opportunity to rewind to that... Um uh, potential penalty issue for the Kiwis and the Irish. That would be fun to see. But d just thinking about the next start, Peter, 
if you think about where the leaders came out of, it was pretty much at the pin end, wasn't it? I mean, it, it was the Kiwis and the Italians were the most left-hand boats off the start line. I'm trying to remember where the Australians were. I can't fully remember where. I, I can't either. I, I suspect they were up the line a little bit from, uh, like there was a little bit of an opportunity when the first two leading boats tacked. I think David was like two or three up and he could just go sh further to the left. So really one and two opened the opportunity for, for David Gilmore to, to own the left. And, and, and he said thanks very much. Yeah, because Burling and Chute tacked earlier than they needed to. So that's the end of the first race of four for the 49er class. And it was David Gilmore from Australia first. And a well-deserved win by them. Uh, the Italians, Chess, uh, uh, Turin and Tessie were second. And Peter Burling Blair to third. We will just have a, a short delay while they set up for the second race of the day, and we are going to... We can replay that situation from Great. the first upwind. That, that's what we're asking for, for the port starboard. And, uh, Marcus, you can roll us through that and uh, tell us what happened and, and give your opinion. What well, do you think? Just a classic port starboard situation, Burling and Tuke tacking here ahead of Seton McGovern, and it does look like... Well, do they pass? Very slight bear away, if any. Yeah. There is a very slight bear away. You can see them dip a little bit, but maybe they just said, let him go, it's okay. Actually, Marcus, um, Marcus, Andy made that point. I wonder, if, if, there's not a, if it's not going to the room, you'd wonder if the, uh, the Irish might have said, hey, yeah, you, know, they, you they, bow forward, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll let you go. Because actually, if you're going to attack there, it's going to hinder our, hinder our chances, maybe. Because yeah, that it, does happen, doesn't it? If they're feeling in a generous mood, then but maybe... It, yeah, it does happen in our sport. If you think, oh, you know, I feel in a good mode. I don't actually want a boat tackingly bowing me. Let them go through. I think if it was Nathan Outridge there, I'm not sure. Would, he wouldn't would have happened. Have, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have happened. I guarantee it. And why aren't we seeing Nathan Outridge in this race? We just need to remind viewers that there's the other side of the draw. We're only watching one half of the 49er qualifying here. And, and the reason, if you looked at the schedule, we were meant to be doing Gold Fleet racing today, but because of the weather conditions on day one, day two, the qualifying has been extended into the fourth day. Uh, we'll do four races today, we've done one, and then tomorrow there will be the split, and Andy, you were saying about 20, the cutoff is 25. 25. Yeah. So... As we were saying for... For the FX, uh, there could be some uh, protests this evening to decide who who get, makes that cut. And there we see Pete Burling and Blair Chuk having uh, a bit of a rest and relaxation, refueling. Fill us in on the New Zealand diet there, Peter. Oh, probably a couple of, you know, mince pies. <laughs> what, left over from Christmas? <laughs> no, no, believe me, at this level... You don't know I have mince pies between races. I, I would think uh, Hamish Wilcox is their coach. Um, and in terms of uh, their between-race plan, it'll, it'll be structured. You know, it'll, they'll talk about the race. They'll rehydrate. They'll have, they might have a bite to eat. Um, I know Blair Took uh, has got stitches in his hand from day one. He had a, quite a nasty cut, and he, he, he's taped up. Uh, he doesn't look to be any difficulty. But what, what about that uh, red object on the back of the coach board? Does that hold any secrets? Oh, they, <laughs> I won't say what I was going to say about that <laughs> object. But what's interesting there, if you look at the mask that Peter Burling's holding on to, that is basically weather analysis. They've got an anemometer there, so Hamish can monitor what's going on around the track, and uh, if there's substantial wind shifts or velocity changes, he can um, use that to talk, talk to his... Um, Talk to his sailors, and, and in fact, that could be, be going on as we speak. Hamish won Yachtsman uh, Coach of the Year in New Zealand last year for his um, his work that he's been doing with uh, Burling and Took. He really is one of the great coaches. I, I think next to Vic, down our way anyway in the Southern Hemisphere, I think Victor Kovalenko probably sets the gold standard, and, and Hamish Wilcox is probably right there with him. Well, Emmett Lazic might have something to say about that as well as uh, having coached uh, two different uh, gold medal winners in 2000 and in uh, 2012. And Marcus Barr is, is another that also worked with Emmett Lazic. Uh, Marcus, what kind of input does Emmett bring to a campaign? 
Ah, just uh, loads of experience, obviously. I mean, he's been in the class for so long. He's been a skiff sailor pretty much all his life. He's been a, one of the early warriors in the moth class when they started foiling. He was in the class. He was a world champion in the moth. He's got so much experience um, that uh, obviously that's the coach you want to have. There's probably just uh, a handful of coaches on the same level as he is in the world in other classes. And if you had Emmett Lazic or Hamish Wilcox out there today, would you be ask, asking them to watch what you're doing or watch what the opposition is doing? Um, probably what the opposition is doing. But I, as I said before, the, the, the job of a coach can be fairly simple uh, if he gets it right. He just has to find out what was the cause of, of the bad and what, what could be done better and, and uh, then the rest is all about keeping the head level of, of the teams he's talking to. Certainly the role of the coach is an interesting one isn't it and, and I think it's very crew specific you know if, if you're a young person new into the game new into 49ers the role of coach is quite different to Hamish Wilcox uh, his role with, with our world champions is quite different and, and, and the, the good coaches have to be able to adapt to that don't you think Andy? Uh, yeah, I think so. It, it, it's, it becomes less of a teaching role and more of an observational role. And um, obviously you, you get another perspective, a, a third eye on um, on how you look when you're sailing the boat, how the sails look compared with the setup of, of the other boats. So who's got more closed or who, who's got more open sails? Um, because the tuning of these boats is quite critical. Um, and then also he's running around um, all edges of the course with that mast and the anemometer measuring what the wind is doing from side to side. Yeah, wind and current. I mean, Hamish was, would have been out having a look uh, left and right on the course for wind direction and wind strength. He may well have been using the marker if, to have a bit, a bit of a look if um, there's any current running in the bay in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So the role of the coach is uh, really... And, and the trick, I think, for the excellent coaches is to understand what really do they need to tell the sailors um, that's going to help them out in the next race because it's very easily you know crap in crap out as such isn't it you know it's 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 very important partnership between um, uh, coach and and athlete well looks like we might be getting into a race soon they're certainly breaking away from Hamish Wilcox and getting sailing again interesting to note that they both wear sunglasses a lot of sailors don't like wearing sunglasses you get a bit of salt spray on the on the lens and then suddenly you can't see so well but the long-term damage that uh, sunshine and the glare off the water can do I can think of a few professional sailors that ended up with cataracts on their eyes very early on even in their 30s so so wearing sunglasses is great if you can make it work but it's it's not to everyone's liking well I, I get the impression Marcus you're not a fan yeah I never liked it I, I always wore a hat though uh, to, to shade my eyes but I wanted to have that clear view and I really didn't like the um, the, the spray on, on sunglasses, it really irritated me. And uh, sailors, uh, it's so important that you can read the, the, the subtle shades uh, of the wind on the water that um, I think, I'm impressed that they can do that well. I must well, po with polarized glasses. lenses help you see those yeah. uh, shades of the, uh, the water even better, I would argue. Yeah, well, they came after in after the... of the world is uh, it's, it's I think it's a training thing if you've if you've been taught it's another coaching role you know your health and well-being if you're being taught as a young kid cover up don't get too sunburnt put block on put your hat on wear sunglasses learn to adapt your eyes to cope with wearing um, sunglasses that are wet because uh, I think it's a health issue certainly for where we're from. Well, Nathan Outridge, he had um, a melanoma taken out of his skin, I think, about a year or so ago. So he's not even 30 years old, and he's yeah. he's had to have it, um, you know, a, a small cancerous growth removed. So those are the real dangers. S looks like uh, I can see the orange flags up. So the start line is in, and we are just waiting for race. It'll be race seven to get underway. Same course. I don't think they've shifted the marks around as I look out. Again, I think I think it's getting uh, a little bit lighter as the afternoon goes on. I just get the impression the breeze is down a little bit. Still plenty and, of breeze. And maybe going further to the right as it... As Still it going right, you think? Could well be. I mean, it 
could be that they're sailing more along the shore and, and uh, port tack more directly out to sea than the FXs were earlier this morning. You observed it in the, in the race just now, Peter, and maybe that trend is continuing. Yeah, it just appeared it was... <laughs> What's interesting with that, though, if it's going right, normally if you're in the right, you tack and you lift into the top mark. But on that first beat, it was still the boat in the left that... that that was strong I, at the top mark. Even if the breeze is going slightly right, I I would still want to protect the left on this race course. I wouldn't want to be the first to test the right on this course. It may well be that we see things changing, but I, uh, the left has still been too strong for me to want to leave it alone. I, I tend to agree. And uh, again, when you look at the decisions that have to be made by the crews and, and with the coaches helping them, certainly leading up to the warning signal, um, you know, left or right, what do you want to be? I think I want left, and, and, and it's those options. And sometimes it comes down to risk or reward. Again, you say, well, okay, the, you might get, you might get something out of the right. Right now, I'd say the risk in the right is too high. Yeah, I agree. And, I agree. and, and the risk in the left, I don't know if there's a lot of risk in the left. Certainly, after all the races we've seen today, if you win the start, get the left. I think you're going to be very strong in the race. We, the other factor here is we've got three more races to go. We've only got two and a half hours of daylight left. So, it, I mean, might just get them in. I think, for me, I sit here, and, and I think the game is changing as we sit here. As the, uh, as the afternoon wears on, we're, you know, we're getting into, what, 25 to 4 local time. And, and as um, dusk comes on us, things change. Dawn and dusk, things change. If you do keelboat yachting. And so I, th- I think that's a very valid point. So we may well see that left-hand strategy, not necessarily in this race, but, but by race four, it might be a different picture. So that, that could be something to look out for. Um, and as the sun goes down and goes closer to the horizon, the need for sunglasses gets stronger and stronger because it gets really hard to see what's going on up the race course. <laughs> well, um, if you want to have a look at um, some videos and portraits, etc., you can, um, how do we get out at that, guys? I'm requested, Andy. What, what I think well, we have an interview uh, of Burling and Oh, Duke we do have. Sorry, day. sorry, I didn't quite understand your, um, your, your, your note. So we're five minutes from the start, and do you want to play? Are we going to play one of the, the little fillers? It'd be quite nice to have a bit of a look. I'm not sure if we're quite ready for that one. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that very shortly. And, Andy, you've got the tide chart there, which is interesting. Because, um, again, another factor can be the change, can't it? Yes. And it, so where it, are we at? Well, 2.42pm um, about an hour ago was high water, so maybe there could be a change in current as well. And one of the things that made it saleable to not saleable a couple of days ago when it was really windy was when the tide turned. And, and when the tide turned against the wind, that really kicked up the waves and suddenly it made it unsaleable and made it really dangerous. So what is the, in terms of the tides here, what, have you got rise and fall on there? What, what are we? What are the tides? Um, we don't. I know. don't have that. No, detail. we don't have that information. Sorry, but is, is it significant? Because certainly, if you have a lot of water flow, it it, it can change the game, can't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's significant enough that uh, when the tide turned the other day, it it went from choppy water to oh my god, it's choppy water and uh, pitch poling, and suddenly they were having to back off on the on the spinnakers and really slow the boats down as much as they could. So. Um, it, Wave state is more important with 49ers than the wind strength. We've got an interview of Peter Burling, uh, the current uh, dominant force in the 49er class coming up. Let's have a look at and get to know him a little better. Yeah, today was uh, obviously day one of the world champs, and that was um, a pretty big forecast last night. I think there's a you know a fair bit of tension this morning as to whether we'd actually get out there for a race today, because um, we're all kind of seen how choppy and, and tricky it gets out there when the breeze gets up and I uh, were really fortunate that it was light enough uh, first thing this morning to, to get out there for a race and yeah well, obviously um, yeah, really fortunate to get a race in this morning and the breeze was light enough uh, before it built a little later on but no we're really happy to, to take a win in that first race we uh, kind of got off the line pretty well and managed to, to keep it upright I, I think if a few guys were swimming and, and doing a fair bit of damage to the gear and uh, we're really happy to, to get a solid one under our belt there to start with. Um, 
yeah, Blair got a little cut in his hand uh, coming in, so yeah, hopefully that's all good, and uh, we're we'll back into it later on. Yeah, obviously this is our you know world champs in Olympic year, and uh, it's something for us. Obviously the goal for the whole campaign is to, to go and try and get the gold in Rio, and uh, it's something that we've got a lot of uh, little steps along the way, and you know, we're trying trying a lot of things this week, and you know, it's just you know good to check in and, and see how everyone's going. And, yeah, we've had a fair bit of time off over the summer, and well, not really time off, but time away from racing, and you know, it's good to check back in and to see how, how everyone else is progressing and to you know, get back into, into the, the final season. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of good nations. I think that's something that we're obviously very excited about in that when we race the 49ers, how many good guys there are out there. And, you know, if you, you have a bad race or you make a mistake, how, how uh, easily you get tripped up. But obviously um, Nathan Goob's a, you know, a pretty big competitor. Uh, they obviously got the gold off us last time. And, uh, we've been kind of battling it out with them, but you know the Spanish boys won last week in Miami, and the British won the week before that in uh, in Rio. So uh, there's plenty of plenty of guys out there that could could take a win and could uh, push us super hard this week. That was Peter Burling just talking to us earlier. Talk about multi-schooled, Andy. I mean, forty what forty nine a world champ three times. He's America's Cup. He's winning the. AC World Series by 10 points for Emirates Team New Zealand, along with Glenn Ashby and the crew. And, of course, Blair Tooks there. Moth Worlds. And, you know, one of the things I th- I'm impressed by the modern sailors is, as opposed to the previous generation, they sail multiple different, multiple dis- disciplines. Moths, some of them are lucky enough, like Nathan Outeridge and, and the Kiwis, to do America's Cup. 49ers, do a bit of keel boating. And, and I think it... It has created a more rounded sailor. I agree, and I've heard some of the British sailors uh, on the Olympic squad say that they wish that they could pursue such a diverse career because uh, the feeling is with the Australians that um, they uh, they really did a lot of diverse sailing leading up to London 2012, and, and all that diverse experience feeds back into their main job of sailing a laser fast or sailing a 49er fast. I mean, the, the, the Aussies did incredibly well at London 2012. Yeah, I think uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough to sail different disciplines, you, you always learn something, don't you? Whether it's, it's a keelboat or whether it's sailing, uh, just the variety, it keeps you fresh. And uh, uh, Nathan Outridge, uh, Peter Burling, I, I mean, I, I think, what I wonder when we look back, is this going to be the future where you'll see these very elite sailors sailing, not specialising necessarily just in Olympic classes? Yeah, no, I think so. We've got about one minute 30 to go, and uh, now we have to decide where we want to start on this start line again. And we think that the breeze is going a little bit further to the right all day. Um, but at the same time, we know how strong the left is, and we know how good it is to start right next to this boat in the front of our picture next to this orange flag. Whoever gets that position right next to this orange flag with a nice start from this end is in a very powerful position to win the race. They're not uh, Certainly, you wouldn't say the fleet at the moment is stacking up to start at the pin, though, would you? There, there seems to be more congestion midline to the top end. They're, as... they're certainly giving themselves a bit of runway here. Um, Let's hope that means that no one's over at the start and we, we have a, a clean getaway. It's coming up to 45 seconds. Boat control being able to position on the line so that when the gun goes, that little time on distance start in the last, the last 10 seconds can be the difference between getting bow forward and strong to be getting covered up. And we're not seeing any of the usual suspects down at this end. Um, we're, the, the French... Uh, in 13, the boat nearest to us. Actually, they're not bad, Julian Dortoli and Noe Delpec, but but the um, the big names we have to look for further up the, the start line. Burling and Tuke in the middle of the fleet at the moment. So we're coming up to nine seconds to go as the boats now move up towards the line. Four, and the bows will come down, speed will come on, and the French, first... French a little bit slow, I thought. There, I think the Americans have started very well. Um, but the French have got away with it. But America, USA 510, I'd say, got the best of the starts at this end of the line. Certainly down towards the pin end, which was the favoured in the first start. The pin end was good. Will it be good as we look across the fleet? This is the second race of the day, day four for the 49ers. The Pretty late in the afternoon. I think the wind is already starting to drop and... 
Some boats are badly stuck at the wind at, at the starting boat. <laughs> Looks terrible. Some boats haven't started. So the US boat. Here we go. We go Ooh, back. And look ouch. at that. Good old T-bone there with... Looks like a match race going Looks on back like there. The Russians got a little bit tangled up. That's unfortunate for those crews. <laughs> Meanwhile at the front... The French are beginning to pull out from underneath the Americans. Uh, the Americans had that great start, David Liebenberg and Daniel Morris. But the French exerting their superiority as, as they sail closer towards the shore. And it is certainly a lot softer now, Peter. Yeah, I mean, it's getting softer. And, and, and as it goes softer, you think, oh, is it going to get a bit funky? And, you know, well, you see some dramatic changes in, in the breeze as the afternoon comes on. But... Again, as I look out my window, the, 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 there's a wooden pier that juts out, but it's not coming into play as the boats come over all the way to the left. And it's the the boats down here towards, start down towards the pin end on starboard. Of course, once you've gone and you're two-thirds of the way on the ley line, then you're looking over your shoulder and going, is there a lane to go back on port? Uh, and that's what these French will be wondering. They've got a great start out to this side, but are they going to be able to make it work? Because they're getting really close to the shore now. They're not very far away from the wooden pier that juts out into the water. They've, they've cleared that comfortably, but uh, they're going to have to tack very, very soon, and it looks like they're going to have to duck a lot of boats when they do. So this favoured pin end may not be so favoured after all, and maybe this right-hand effect is beginning to have its effect on, on the way that the sailors have to attack this course. So boats will be starting to look. Crews are looking over their shoulder. Time to get out of here. Can we find a lane to go back the other way? Trying to always avoid doing a double tack. If you tack and then get tacked again or you've got to do a dip as we go on board with Burling and Took. I've got someone up on their hip. It's amazing how powered up they still look because there's not a lot of breeze out there now. And the boat behind them is USA 808. They're now ducking them. Oh, but they tack as well. They tack as well, yeah. No, it's uh, USA 510. So we've got char the charging back towards the other side of the course. And what are you showing there, Marcus, in terms of the, the data coming in? USA 808? Uh, mm. In the lead... At the moment, that's... Well, it's bow to bow, isn't it? The, the, yeah. the Americans and the Kiwis are bow to bow. Uh, we have a look on the water, maybe. Andy, you can have a look. How does it look out the window? Certainly the animation is showing uh, New Zealand, USA, pretty well bow to bow. I think uh, it's hard for me to say from here, but um, in terms of how they're doing relative to each other, but I still like the left. I think the left is still okay, but I think there's more possibilities in the right. I think the opportunities are opening up more on both sides of the course. So we are about halfway up the windward beat. They boats have come across on starboard. They've all, the majority of the fleet now have tacked, going across on port. And the animation, the data is saying Burling and Took, Burroughs and Morris from the USA second. Visconti, Italy, third. That's the top three. As uh, now, uh, that's a bit clearer now. I think uh, Burling and Took look pretty strong there, uh, middle of the fleet. They must have got a good start. So they started up sort of midline, top third, and then found the lane to come across on. I think that's right. I, th I think that's what they did. And um, I wonder why they changed from. Uh, from starting closer down towards the pin. It certainly seems to have been the right thing to have done. But what did they see? Maybe it was that the breeze had gone a little bit further right. And uh, I look at the... We were talking about current change or tide change. To me, the sea state looks quite choppy, but now there's like a, a, a rolling swell coming through. It's not affecting... The boats are just riding over the top, but, it, but it's actually quite bumpy out there. It is, yeah. There's sort of two different kinds of wave pattern, one riding over the top of the other. But they still look full-stretched. I'm always amazed how powered up these boats are, even in quite light winds. In, in terms of setup, as the day now goes quiet and the boats start depowering, between races, they probably 
change their their um, their settings. Yeah, you're saying they'd soften up a little bit. Yeah, they they'd would. Let, they, let the stays off a little bit. They get the spanners onto the side stays, the the ones that support the mast, and they would loosen them a little, little bit and allow the mast to stand a bit straighter, which then allows the sails to deepen out. You want fuller sails to help punch you through these waves. And and certainly with this sea state, you you would you'd want you need power to get through and the the jib, the jib I guess with a little bit more entry, a little bit more depth in the front of the jib with a softer fourth stay. Yeah, that's right. You give away a little bit of your pointing ability just for a, a little bit of raw power to be able to get through the waves. But this I, looks I, good for the Kiwis. Walking around the boat park, I was impressed um, to see. Uh, a lot of the crew, certainly the good ones, they all, everything's documented, eh? It's catalogued, they have the book, they have the settings. It's like tyre pressure in the car, you know, you say, oh, we'll just take a couple of pounds out. That's right, that's what you do. You, once you've got some fast settings, you, you log it, you want to make sure that you can replicate those settings as easily as possible. And there are small variations between sails and masts as well, so you, you whilst the sails are all supposedly identical millimeters make such a difference on all this kit when you're selling at this level yeah one design boats supplied equipment but there are very very subtle differences and and i guess the trick is and and i know burling and Toot do a lot of this is, is when you get your equipment it's cataloged and you you can identify the differences and what that means to the setups that you want and i'm not saying it's outside of the rules but the just manufacturing differences although they're minute and we know, even from a laser mast, that, that it does make a difference. And sailors can feel it pretty quickly when, when they go racing against other boats. They can feel whether they've got that extra little edge. Well, Marcus, it's, uh, as you would say, business as usual. The, um, yeah, we, we see <laughs> Burling and Duke going around the wind with Mark first after having their discard in the last race. <laughs> <laughs> that discard of third place. <laughs> and they've got a number one in the sale, that makes sense. It's got quiet though. It, things are changing, aren't they? The, the, as, the la afternoon, as the afternoon goes on, Gilmore back in the hunt, having a good day. Won the previous race, needs to be doing this. Ooh, low set on the Italian boat. Yeah, good attacking maneuver oh. there by the Italians. But, but now they go f into a full stop. That was a bit <laughs> radical. And there's oh, the, where the Spanish are going. The Spanish are having a, a good They're tussle. rolling the other Spanish. And you can see from this shot here how the lead is just extend and extend because everyone is holding each other up here. The Danes and number 30 are defending on the Americans. They're telling the, the Americans, look, just get down the course. You know, but look how much higher all these other boats are going than they need to because they're defending it, their air. Oh, 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 ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> that was a thread the needle. <laughs> I thought this was <laughs> T-bone coming. But, uh, <laughs> oh, the you great, can see how the great. Yes, it is. Spanish roll on the left of the screen with the blue spinnaker trying to roll over the top of the black spinnaker. And it looks like the black spinnaker is going to get spat out the back. Uh, it looks like they could protest. Their head was in the spinnaker of the windward boat. Right, okay, so all kinds of shenanigans going on, but out of picture, Pete Burling and Blair Chuk will be smiling to themselves. All this kind well, of traffic. Well, this is all happening. They're, just they're sailing the right angle, the leading boats, and they'll be gone. And they are gone already. I mean, I can see out the window, they, they already have night and day between themselves and the rest of the fleet. I would have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall for the debrief. What do you reckon? With Hamish. Well, just now. Or, no, the, or, between races. Or what? Getting that discard of the third place. Yeah, he gave him a hard time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should think no, so. I th look, I, th I think they're brutal on each other in terms of their learning and they w they want to always develop and, and, and sort of be error free. Uh, I think they'll be like you, Marcus. You, you're yeah, pretty yeah. brutal on. You deserve a beating when you come home with a third place. <laughs> <laughs> a bad beating. It could have been flawless, and now look at that. It could. It's Is great. that it? Is that all he can do? Ah, <laughs> oh, dear me. A chink of mortality we saw in that previous race. <laughs> what they showed, though, up there... Let's just go back to this race. They came They came off the line, and and I think the New Zealanders were mid-fleet. But somewhere in that... Um, after the When the boats tacked onto port, they, they weren't that strong. They, they were sort of half bow forward. To go from bow forward to being dominant so that they were two boat lengths ahead at the top mark, that's pace. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, you, just, a, just a drop kick in, in terms of one tack, 
your your marginal bow forward on the on the boat the second boat, and then by the top mark your two boat lengths ahead. That that's that's pace coordination teamwork. And you can see the subtle movements there on board the Kiwi light, boat, eh? and it is light, by no means fully stretched anymore. But uh, these guys don't seem to have any weak points. One of the really impressive things about the best sailors is it doesn't matter what conditions are thrown at them. They are still the masters of whatever conditions come along, whereas there are others that are specialists. Some of the lighter teams tend to be good in light winds. Some of the heavier teams tend to be good in strong winds. But being good in all of it is a real talent. Now, Marcus, talk to me about, in terms of looking at these guys, because they are the gold standard. Burling's big. Now, we talk, we, when we were talking the FXs, we were talking a lot about small skippers, big crews. This defies that. Yeah. And, and he's a big guy. And, and, and his, uh, players, his skills. Players smaller. Yeah. Well, I think in the 49, it doesn't matter that much who's taller and who's smaller. Obviously, in other classes, you want a very tall crew because he's the one who's on, on the trapeze. In the 49, it doesn't matter that much. But being that tall... You would think, you know, maybe a little bit clumsy, but not at all. I mean, we saw him three years ago at the Europeans in Aarhus. I was so impressed at the light wind final day where, where he won um, that, that th those conditions didn't phase him at all. He was super confident, and I thought, wow, he's going to have a problem. I think they conditions. really pride themselves on crew work and, and maneuvers. Mm. Uh, but, but I, uh, Andy, your comments on, you know, in terms of we look at them as they come into the bottom mark gate. We probably should get around the bottom mark gate first, but I'd like to know your comments on, uh, you know, the sizing thing. Um, All right, well, let, let's come back to that. But uh, it looks like uh, Gilmore and Brake could still attack them. Which side are Burling and Chute going to go? Looks like they're going around the right-hand side. So that's unusual. With this is the first time we've seen a leader of a race today go round the right hand mark. I think there's gate bias. And there is a gate you, bias. You can probably again. tell yes, us. Yes, yes, Marcus. absolutely. There is a slight gate, gate bias. Well, actually, not that slight. It's quite strong. So, and so that's why. So now he wants to head out to the right hand side and go above the boats coming downwind from the left hand side. And, um, and I think the because of the, the big gate bias, the majority of the fleet, I'd see there's one come around. And by the way, this is a really interesting battle going on between the two Spanish boats. Apparently, they have their selection here as well, so they will, will be fighting each other hard. At the moment, Boutin, Lopez, uh, and Lopez Mara have the upper hand, but the Alonso brothers are closely behind. They're tacking early after that mark rounding into the congested area of all the boats coming downwind from the favored left-hand side of the course where the other Spanish yep they follow him this, that's a close match race we're seeing here I think what we're seeing also is the countries that are, are using this world championship that have multiple entries here as, as a selection trial it, it is affecting the way the guys sail and and the women for that matter yeah, well, those uh, Spanish teams will be in a match race to decide who goes and represents Spain at Rio 2016. The Alonsos, they had the race of their lives in Argentina. They were third in the, in the last Worlds, which is by far the best result in their long, long career. They've probably been in the class pretty much longer than anybody else here at this regatta, whereas Botina and Lopez Mara are relative newcomers. They've only been in the class three or four years. The Alonsos have been in the class for more than 10 years, but they've still not been to the Games. Third at the World Championships, that puts them in, in strong stead for qualifying, but uh, it's not over because they've got, they've got this regatta and possibly more to come. So it is certainly a big year in terms of, obviously this, this is a pinnacle event, the World Championships for 49 and 49 at FX, but everyone is looking ahead to the Olympics. It's special, it's different. The, the, the demands are different, and uh, we're already seeing six months out from the games, some of the teams, the Germans. The Big bend in the trail of Berling and Tuke, by the way, up there. I can see that they, they bore away, but now they, they're coming back up. There is some slight shifts. It's not you know pencil straight if you look at the line sure. of the boats on the water. Um, it is not as steady as I would initially thought. Do you think it's pressure as opposed to shift? Because that makes a huge difference to these boats, doesn't it? Could be. Yeah. It doesn't look that gusty, though. I think the Kiwis look a little bit softer out to sea than some of the boats closer to the shore. Cer um, certainly eyeballing it, I'd uh, tend to agree. 
I don't think they're in too much trouble, but I think they've maybe sailed further than they needed to. I think it might have helped them if they'd attacked a little bit earlier. I think it gives a chink of possibility that maybe the Australians and the Italians could attack the Kiwis. Yeah, the, the leader's line is, is just coming is closing down. in a little bit on board Burling and Hugh. Now, now, just in terms of the technical stuff, I'll come back to you again, Marcus, because you're the, you know, the 49er. Two Olympics, Sydney, Athens, fantastic. Trapezing height. Tell me about trapezing height. What 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 are we? What should we, we be looking at when you look at the the crews? And because you see them altering their height, what's going on there? Well, it means that they've got there's too little pressure to to stay fully stretched. You really want to stay fully stretched as long as possible because there's actually slighter, a slightly lighter apparent wind down on over the water surface. So if you're that in that area, you've got less drag. Um, but if you can't fully stretch anymore, you got to bend your legs. Then you decide, uh, do both bend their legs at the same time? I usually like to stay steady as a helmsman to steer more cleanly and not to put any uh, rough movement, movements into the rudder. So I wanted my crew to move first, but that's up for preference, I guess. So when you look again at the st at Burling and Toot, what, what, what do you think of um, their technique in terms of... Um Trapezing? Are you seeing anything I, I there? Think they're fully stretched now. They must have a lot of power. You know, I, I look at their onboard right now, and uh, it doesn't look like they're bending their legs a whole lot. I watched the New Zealand Nationals uh, earlier in the year, and it, it was a bit more breeze than this. But w w the observation I made with them, they they seem to trapeze lower. It was reasonably fresh, but re a lot lower than the, the other young guys that were sailing in New Zealand. I think that makes a big difference. Young sailors underestimate the power of drag. Because, they, you know, you always think about how can I go faster, but what you really need to do is reduce drag. And if you're trapezing lower, you have a lot less drag because there's less apparent wind I got to, to the water surface. As a weekend sailor, I've got some input into this. And I, I think the better you get, the lower you dare trapeze. But it means you've got a smaller margin of error. It's easier to be teabagged, dropped in the water if the wind suddenly changes. So to some extent, you should only trapeze as low as your skill allows. And um, so weekend sailors, I think, tend to trapeze a little bit higher because it gives them a bit more margin of error. Well, not next week. They're going to go out there. They're going to drop themselves down six inches, and uh, they're going to listen to Andy Rice and well, Marcus Bauer. Something to try for the summer when the water's That's a, good, a little bit warmer. But, but in term, on, on a serious note, if you're a young sailor, you know, listen to these guys because it's, it's things like that when you look at the quality of sailors of Burling and Took that make a difference. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the finals, by the way, because then the racing is going to be a bit, well, probably a lot tighter. Um, I'm and, looking and, forward and, and to the outridge burling battle. Yeah. By the way, I've got some results coming in from the from the earlier races today, and uh, Outridge and Jensen finished seventh in the first race on their course. Pink and Bithel won their race. So... Um, How does that leave the overall standings as we look at it now? Pink and Bithel in second place, uh, Outridge Jensen in third, um, but they haven't done their racing yet for the for the uh, Q7. That that's the second race of the day. For me, it's still too early to be looking at points, boys. Absolutely, you know. this is a qualification we intended to have the first day of broadcasting on the first day of the finals, but it did get delayed. So we're getting a peak of the qualification now. Well, this is a, a bit of a bonus because we are seeing certainly come back with us tomorrow because you, in, in terms of the 49er fleet, what I'm looking forward to is uh, Burling against Outeridge, Aussie that, Kiwi. That's the classic battle. I mean, Gold medalist, silver medalist, you know, Gandhi, give us the cliches. Those two have been the standout sailors of the past five, six, seven, eight years of the 49er. And uh, it's funny how uh, Olympic classes, when so many people are trying so hard to be the best in the world, it's funny how some of these Olympic classes are dominated by certain sailors. And we see that in a number of classes. It, it, the Nacras just across the water, Billy Besson, Marie Ryu, who have won the, the three world championships in the Nacra. Um, these guys, Pete Burling, Blair Chuk, winning, well, I think they're winning streak if they win here, this world championship. It, 
championship here. It would be their 23rd successive international victory. The last time they were beaten, the last time they lost, was when they won a silver medal at London 2012. So that wasn't too shabby either. You but can't stress how unusual that is in sailing. Anybody who knows anything about I don't sailing. Think, for me, I don't, I don't think it's been done before. Has it, Andy? Do you, you, you're pretty good with the history. I, uh, ben, I think they've probably gone past the winning streak of Picking up a very impressive set of um, successive victories. I think he got to about 16 or 17. So that was that was pretty amazing. Ben Ainsley, I think his winning streak was uh, immense in the Finn. And Giles Scott must be getting there in the Finn now. He's as dominant in the Finn for Great Britain as the as these Kiwis. Uh, it'll be one of the stories. I'm sure you and I will sit around and think, what's happening with our sport? You know, Giles Scott, Burling and Took. Belcher out of Australia. If New Zealand awesome. doesn't get the gold medal in the Olympics, it, it will be seen as a failure. Because well, they... don't guarantee it because Olympics is a different animal. But let's get back. I mean, we keep talking about Burling and Took. And yeah, just one last bit of data for him. Uh, he does have the highest average speed in this race. Uh, that's what the data says. He's okay. Third place board is eight points. It's on average speed. But... And they're not that big, and it. I I always say that that happened. Morgan last team. Twenty one for Australia. I didn't pick up who that was. I'd have to have a look through my. In crew. The, the graphic going up wins. Oh, that... It was Gilmore. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's who are currently, it's saying in four. When we look at it, the... Well, let's see how things really pan out, because... Sometimes cause around marks, it all gets yeah. a little bit tight and confused. But... This time we see Berling and Chuk coming in shore very early on this time. Uh, they did look a little bit more vulnerable for going out to sea on this time now, sailor looks like they've moved two things they have done as the boat gets trapezing position you don't need that low so uh, it's interesting how both be the 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 one to bend different guy and 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 i used to make those same observations when he was sailing the foiling moth mm. I, I think it's the same with ben ainsley he he doesn't look that gainly on the shore but he gets put in him a in a boat yeah he's like a panther but Yehudi Menuhin, the, the violinist, he, he, he <laughs> suffered from ter Good comparison. terrible arthritis, and he could barely open, open his fingers. Um, but, but when he got his hands on his violin, they, suddenly, he, he, this 80-year-old, this 90-year-old, all, all the pain, all the arthritis went away, and he could still play that bi violin to perfection. So there's something strange that goes on with the human body like that. Well, I've got to use that. I can't miss the opportunity. And Burling and Took are playing the field like a violin. <laughs> <laughs> We're always searching for more cliches, aren't we? Must be getting late in the day. <laughs> so, huh, let's go back to the Spanish. And uh, we see that Bochin and Lopez have climbed up to second place. They'll be happy about that. And, Another uh, point. Yep, Alonso. In the big scheme of life. Alonso brothers down in sixth place. So, Alonso brothers going into the World Championships were ahead, head to head. Uh, well, they, they were ahead because they finished Boating. third in the World Championships. Okay. Nice shot of the leaders, by the way. It is With a nice a shot. 70 meter lead over the rest of the fleet. That's why we don't see any of them. They got good power there again. They're fully stretched again. Yeah, so bottom of the course was quite soft, but as they head up, uh, they're, on, they're just below the ley line to the top mark. They're fully powered up going in, into the mark. Charging through the clear waters of clear water. It's not that clear. It's quite muddy. Sand bottom, mud bottom, I guess, out there. It's shallow. It's shallow, isn't it? 16 foot deep, something like that. Yeah, that's why we had so many broken masts on the first days. Capsized and broke them, snapped them. Yeah, it's been an expensive first half of the week. Beautiful tack. Even the best slow down an awful lot through a, um, a 49 attack, though. The boat is so light, has no momentum really. 
Say very clean set, super clean set. I mean, that's for the books. It is. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, again, we go back to the Europeans 2013 when I was lucky enough to be with you guys. And um, traditionally, New Zealanders, Australians are good in a breeze because that's what we get. We get a lot of wind and, and, and stuff, so they feel comfy. Normally, the Achilles heel will be the light conditions. I think these guys are an exception. They seem to have this Obviously, yeah. over the range, and, and you were commenting on, commenting on it earlier. Um, I, I in just terms can't of make their out their ability to live with the boat. And, I, I t- still can't make out where the superiority comes from. Whether it's the sum of the little things. I mean, that was a very clean uh, windward mark rounding, super clean, flawless. You you can't do it better than that. But is it just that? Is it just the little details that it, add up? It, it is the law of marginal gains. I think it's a little bit of everything, isn't it? Um, Peter Lester was was saying earlier just how meticulous they are about recording all their settings calibrating everything so they're very scientific about it they apply themselves to the to the engineering side of the game but they also apply them, themselves to the to the tactical side of the game with the help of Hamish Wilcox and also to the boat handling the actual me- the human mechanics of what's involved I think I'm right in saying um, Burling is studying engineering at Auckland University it'll probably take him 20 years to get through the degree like Russell Coots but he, he comes from a, a you know a physical engineering background he He's obviously intrigued by what makes stuff work. And and uh, I think in our sport, if, if you do have that mindset, but like you, you're from an ag- um, architecture background, aren't you, Marcus? I, 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 think, it, I think it helps, uh, Andy, don't you? If, you? if you're analytical, you can look at a piece of kit or look at a... You know, it's an equipment sport, and you can, you can relate what you're looking at to... Principles of engineering. I think you've got an advantage. Well, I, I think you've seen that in Formula One. Michael Schumacher. He got hold of Ferrari. They were in a bit of a, a, a bad spot when he joined them. You wonder why would he leave Renault, where he's already won two or three world championships? Well, he turned Ferrari around because, again, it was the perfect um, melding of man and machine. And he was someone that could drive a, a car really fast, but also understood why a car was going slowly and, and knew what he needed to do to change it. So we've. Uh, you know, talked a lot. We haven't talked a lot about the guys, uh, Peter Burling, Blair too, because they're a long way out in the lead in this one. He, they had a, a third in the first race, but um, they've dominated this race. Oh, they're going to co- go across. They're very close to going across the line to win. But for me, the defining moment in this race for me, first beat when they got onto port, bow to bow with essentially two or three other boats. I thought they had a wee bit of pace on everyone. They got about, so they go through the line to take it. They got one boat length ahead, and from there they were gone. So there was a little bit of a, a boat speed, um, a little bit of a boat speed factor, I thought, at the top end of that first beat. Andy, what, what would have been your summary for them? Well, I think you, you just nailed it there. It's just those small things in stressful situations. I, I think it's the ability to keep on sailing at your very best and not be spooked by the boats around you. When they tacked onto port, they didn't know if they were going to be able to cross the American boat or not. Then the American boat tacked as well, which let them off the hook of, of were they going to cross or weren't they. Um, but it's, it's being able to sail at your very best, even when you've got all the noise around you of, of traffic. Because some of us go to pieces when, when the pressure's on, when there are other boats around you. You can't always pick when you tack and jibe in a, in a tight fleet like this. But if you can do it well, you can come out of those marginal situations ahead of the people around you. Looking at, looking at the data, I can, I can tell that, that they were just 0.2 faster than, uh, than the second place boat. And they did a lot less maneuvers. I mean, that adds to the average speed, of course, if you do less moves. They only had 11 maneuvers, whereas the Spanish had 19. So uh, less maneuvering, higher average speed. Distance wasn't down. It didn't cover less distance. And what, what were the distances like between the top three, for example? Well, that uh, Burling and Hugh almost did nine kilometers. Uh, well, it's eight point nine six kilometers, where uh, the Spanish did eight point nine four kilometers. So they actually covered two hundred meters less than than Burling and Hugh. But uh, yeah, speed difference makes makes a bigger bigger but, difference. But the big number there, uh, eight eight maneuvers, is uh, quite a big difference. 
I think we might be in for an interview with the race winners uh, straight off the wall. So we've got Ben Ramoka, the class secretary, out there on the race course, and he will try to talk to Peter Burling and Blair Tuke now. Here we are with uh, Peter Burling and Blair Tuke, winners of this race. Uh, not a perfect day for you yet, but pretty darn good. What do you have to say for yourself so far? Yeah, obviously really happy to kind of get another couple of good scores on the board today. Um, you know, it's pretty challenging and the breeze is dying pretty quickly at the moment, so I'm uh, happy just to get around and uh, yeah, still got plenty of racing to go over the next few days. How do you manage to keep your settings right through a de decaying breeze like this? Uh, do you aim in a certain direction or otherwise? Yeah, we got a little bit wrong in that one, but uh, I think everyone probably did the breeze drop by about three knots probably uh, just after the start, so uh, we just tried to deal with it the best we can and uh, keep the boat powered up, especially with this really choppy uh, condition is quite hard. You were one of the first teams to start going around the uh, outside gate and then tacking across today. Do you feel like, uh, or tell, tell us why you're doing that? <laughs> uh, yeah, particularly in these conditions, you know, you're just on the verge of being overpower, or over max power or under max power. And if you're in the wind shadows, you're spending a lot of time crouching and losing a lot of distance. So a fair few times we've taken that, that option and tried to get above all the wind shadows into the clear air before we headed left. So it um, seems to be kind of paying out occasionally and losing out occasionally. But it's another option. All right. Well, good luck the rest of the way. We'll be following you all week. So you want to say hi to all the folks back home? Yeah, hey, everyone watching. Uh, we'll hope you're watching anyway. Uh, we're having good fun here and not hurting ourselves too much. <laughs> back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Ben. And certainly... Uh it's intriguing. They sort of they don't tell you too much, really. But in, in in terms of their strategy for that mark rounding, it was it was as you pointed out, Andy, um, wind shadow. You know, just yeah, to, and it's traffic. such a big deal if you can get out into clear air, especially in a high performance boat like the Forty um, Nine er. That was and but Burling did say, oh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I think we saw that, didn't we? So they were a bit fifty. He was a bit fifty fifty on it. To to be to be blunt. We will just now go, oh, no, uh, we're going to have a look at results in a minute. So we are close to being done for the day, to be honest. The, there's, the wind is dying. They, the schedule is to have two more races. We will not be covering, covering them. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Andy Rice for helping here today. He's done a great job. Marcus Bauer driving the bus. and Join us again tomorrow. Racing will resume about the same time, 12 o'clock local time. And it will be Gold Fleet Racing from the 49er Worlds here in Clearwater.